I walked through the woods, feeling the crunch of fallen leaves under my boots. The sun was setting, and the remaining light reflected off Lake Troip in the distance. A friend had told me about their family cabin, nestled somewhere nearby, offering me an escape from city life for a while. My name is Dawson Brinkley, by the way, just your average guy trying to find a bit of solitude. The sky painted hues of orange and pink as I followed a seldom trodden path toward the cabin. Eventually, I arrived at the quaint wooden structure hidden among tall trees. It had an old-fashioned charm to it that was both inviting and cozy. After settling in, I lit a fire in the fireplace and decided to start writing in my journal. As a kid growing up on a cattle farm, I didn't have many chances to explore the country's nooks and crannies, so this little trip felt special. The first night passed uneventfully. However, on the next day, I decided to check out Lake Troip up close. While walking along its shores, I stumbled upon something odd. Barely visible through thick brush was what looked like an old campsite. Among the scattered remnants of furniture and mangled tents lay several old hiking bags, torn apart as if by wild animals. Concerned about lurking dangers, I cautiously made my way back to the cabin and took it upon myself to contact law enforcement. Despite my efforts, however, I couldn't get any cell reception out there. Growing anxious but still not ready to abandon my retreat prematurely, I decided to approach some neighboring cabins, though they appeared empty too. That afternoon I ventured further into the woods in search of other people, or maybe even signs of what could have transpired in this isolated corner of nature. As daylight gradually waned, fatigue settled in from journeying through dense foliage and unforgiving terrain. Just when I was about to begin retracing my steps, a faint noise caught my attention. It seemed to emanate from deeper in the forest. Against my better judgment, curiosity got the best of me. I crept deeper into the woods, wondering what could be lurking out there. Every step reverberated with a looming sense of dread, and my skin prickled as if under the watchful gaze of some unseen entity. The source of the noise grew more evident as I proceeded, a sickening, wet crunch accompanied by a low growl. My pulse raced and adrenaline surged, but I remained frozen in place with morbid curiosity overpowering any instincts for self-preservation. As I rounded a particularly colossal oak tree, I witnessed a sight that will likely haunt me for the rest of my life. Standing there was an enormous creature, almost human-shaped but with elongated limbs adorned with gnarly claws. Its mouth was smeared with gore as it fed on its prey with a voracious appetite. A human body lay partially dismembered at its feet. I felt bow rise in my throat but managed to stifle the urge to vomit, somehow remaining eerily silent as well. The beast hardly seemed aware of my presence. Perhaps sensing its meal was finally complete or growing bored with its prize, it lifted its head and let out an unsettling howl before casually making its way deeper into the forest. At that moment, all rationality abandoned me, and I bolted straight back toward the safety of the cabin. Panic enveloped me as thorny branches clawed at my face and clothing while navigating through that accursed wood. Somehow, Despite distorted perceptions and sheer terror clouding my every thought, I managed to retrace my steps and reach the cabin, slamming the door shut behind me and breathing heavily. As midnight approached, sleep eluded me while I wrestled with fear creeping over every inch of my being. I wondered how I'd ever managed to leave this cabin without crossing paths with that monstrous entity again. The unforgiving woods no longer seemed like a welcome escape from city life but rather more of a trap ensnaring me in its torturous grip. With each passing hour, my thoughts grew more frantic. It became apparent that I wouldn't be able to make it out of the cabin alone, considering the creature lurking in the woods. I needed help, 
but I couldn't recall if there was a phone in the cabin or not. In this secluded area, there were no neighbors close by to assist me, nor any police stations within reach. As daybreak arrived, I cautiously ventured towards the front window to observe if the creature had returned during the night. There were no signs of it, but also no evidence that it had ever been there in the first place, besides the horrifying images locked in my memory. Attempting to stay away from view, I searched every corner of the cabin for a phone. Dollar image dollar to my relief, under a stack of old newspapers, I found an ancient-looking landline. It took a couple tries to get a dial tone. I dialed the only number I could think of my best friend. Hey, it's me, I whispered urgently when he answered. I need your help. Something horrible happened here. My friend listened intently as I described the grisly scene and monstrous creature that haunted me since yesterday's encounter. Without hesitation, he agreed to help and promised he would drive over as quickly as possible. I'll be there soon, he assured me before hanging up. Hours went by with no sign of his arrival. The sun began to set once again, casting eerie shadows throughout my surroundings until darkness enveloped everything outside. Without warning, shrill screams pierced through the night, horrific echoes from some unfortunate soul suffering at the hands of that monstrous entity. I began to realize that maybe coming here was a mistake. Not only had my life been put into jeopardy, but now lives of others were at stake too. The thought weighed heavily on me as more screams filled the air. Finally, headlights cut through the darkness and my friend's car pulled up to the cabin. He stepped out, looking determined and ready to face whatever lay ahead. You really saw something? he asked, staring intently into the dark forest. I nodded. I can't explain it, but I know it was real, and I think it's nearby. Before I could comprehend what was happening, terrible cries for help emanated from the woods, as if taunting us. My friend and I exchanged a look of sheer terror but realized our only option was to attempt escape together. We clambered into his car and he slammed on the accelerator, the wheels squealing as we sped away from that nightmarish place. As we put distance between us and the dreaded forest, we noticed an eerie calm settling over us, no more chilling screams or grotesque visions. It felt like a narrow escape from certain doom. Weeks went by and life almost returned to normal, but day after day, I couldn't shake thoughts of those whose lives were ended by that horrific creature lives that I couldn't save. As much as I tried to live in denial of what happened, pretending that everything was fine would never bring justice to those who suffered at the hands of whatever still lurked hidden in those woods. The reality of what transpired forever changed my perspective on the world. Dangers too real to ignore lie within even the most ordinary places. A newspaper article caught my attention one day about mysterious disappearances occurring not far from where my nightmare began, people vanishing without a trace with disturbingly similar descriptions of a strange monstrous figure lurking nearby. Though physically unharmed in my own ordeal, deep inside I knew I carried an anguished responsibility for those victims, a burden that would haunt the remainder of my days. I couldn't let this creature continue to kill. Failure to act would be complicity in its brutal reign of terror. As much as fear gripped me, knowing the truth required confronting not only the horrors of that dark forest, but my own fears of the unknown, and addressing them head on. I've always enjoyed my moments of solitude, and living in a cabin within the dense forests of Oregon was perfect for my nature-loving self. My name is Jebediah Kretzmer, and I'm a writer seeking inspiration. A few months ago, I moved into this wooden haven by the woods, 
unaware of the unsettling events that would occur. I met some of the locals in town while buying groceries. One day, during my usual walk into town, an old man named Norbert Kirsting struck up a conversation with me. He mentioned in passing about people going missing around the area occasionally and laughed it off as mere folklore. I brushed it off too, thinking nothing out of the ordinary. The forest surrounding my cabin always had a certain stillness to it that I appreciated. The expansive woods provided comfort and solace from humans and their noise. Until one day, the calmness was interrupted by an agonizing scream from somewhere deep within the woods. That was when everything changed. Inquisitive by nature, I decided to investigate the direction from which the scream came. I came upon a small group of people that lived nearby who were searching frantically for their lost friend, someone who had never returned after going out for a walk. Days passed as more people in the area reported their loved ones missing. The community began to live in fear. Each day that passed grew more tense than before. There was talk of some unknown creature responsible for these disappearances. At first, we all scoffed at the idea. It wasn't until we stumbled upon something horrifying mid-search that our skepticism turned into dread a torn piece of clothing belonging to one of our neighbors hanging from a tree branch alongside large claw marks embedded in the bark. As more evidence mounted about an unknown predator stalking our homes and terrorizing our loved ones, we formed a small militia armed with knives and firearms to hunt down whatever was responsible. We knew that the authorities would take too long to arrive and by then, it might be too late. During one of our nightly stakeouts, I caught a glimpse of the creature. It was large, standing tall on two legs like a man but covered in matted hair. Its muscular body bore the marks of countless battles, and its eyes gleamed with an unnerving intelligence. We soon realized that our interactions with the creature were not solely one-sided. The beast seemed to be playing a twisted game with us, stalking us and watching our every move, waiting for the right opportunity to strike. It became apparent that calling for backup would only provoke it to continue its rampage. The pursuit continued as we tracked the creature's movements over several weeks. We grew increasingly reckless in our desperate attempts to understand and confront this unknown menace. Along the way, we began sharing snippets from our personal lives as a way to keep some semblance of normalcy. Our group continually patrolled the area, hoping that we would catch the creature in a moment of vulnerability. However, it became abundantly clear that our efforts were futile. The creature was highly intelligent and knew how to evade us while continuously picking off community members one by one. One night during our patrol, we heard a blood-curdling scream in the distance. We rushed towards the sound and found one of our own, Jill, laying on the ground with her limbs contorted unnaturally and deep gashes on her body. We quickly brought her to the makeshift clinic we had set up in our community. As I sat outside the clinic, I overheard a conversation between two older men discussing that they had encountered something similar decades ago. According to them, a similar creature had stalked their village in their youth until it suddenly disappeared without any explanation. Desperate for help, I made up my mind to call the local wildlife control center for aid but was met with skepticism and dismissive behavior. They believed our claims were nothing more than an elaborate prank or a result of mass hysteria. As much as I pleaded with them to at least visit and investigate, they refused. The following night, we continued our vigilance after making arrangements for Jill's swift recovery. The creature's attacks became more bold and vicious as if it was losing patience with our attempts at resistance. Entire houses were torn apart on some occasions. One evening during patrol, Mike, one of our trusted friends and neighbor who had always been able to maintain a calm demeanor under pressure, 
began frantically shouting while pointing to something in the nearby woods. It took me a moment to register what he saw. It was the creature watching us from between trees. Before any of us could react, the beast lunged at Mike and tackled him to the ground with lightning speed. We heard his bones snapping under its weight as it tore at his flesh with ferocity. We fired our weapons at the beast, showering it with bullets, but it simply glared back at us in defiance as rage seemed to grip its eyes even more tightly. Seeing the creature's intent to finish off Mike, a shift in strategy came over me. I marched forward and taunted the beast to try and get its attention. It locked its gaze onto me and its attention turned to me immediately. I sprinted in the opposite direction, hoping it would follow me and give Mike a chance at survival. The creature seemed to enjoy this diversion and pursued my fleeing figure, though it was significantly faster than any human could ever hope to be. It toyed with me, darting between trees before lunging out to swipe at my back with razor-sharp claws. I could feel warm blood trickle down my torso as I narrowly dodged yet another vicious swipe. We raced through the woods with the creature never far behind me. Aware that I could not continue this dangerous dance for much longer, I searched for anything in our environment that might provide an advantage or a means of escape. My eyes fell upon a waterfall cascading down from a jagged cliff face. Summoning every ounce of courage and strength left in my body, I ran towards the edge of the cliff and leaped into the fray, plummeting into icy waters below. The creature skidded to a stop at the edge of the precipice but did not follow suit. When I emerged from the water gasping for air, I grabbed onto a submerged log for support as exhaustion weighed heavy on my limbs. The creature had disappeared from sight once again. The attack on Mike marked a turning point for our community. Many abandoned their homes out of fear that they could be next on the creature's list of victims. Those who were too stubborn to leave banded together and fortified their homes in hopes that it would deter further attacks. Our group continued our pursuit of the creature however after several more weeks, its attacks ceased abruptly. Some claimed it left knowing its reign of terror had ultimately splintered our community, while others whispered that it might be back once we had lulled ourselves into a false sense of security. In either case, the damage inflicted by the creature left a lasting impact on all those who witnessed its nightmarish existence. We salvaged what we could from our shattered lives, scarred by shared memories and irreparable losses bound together in an eternal struggle to move on from the horrors that had emerged from that dark wilderness. Late afternoon sun filtered through the tall trees surrounding my cabin in Eagle's Nest, a small yet breathtaking town in New Mexico. My name is Harold Dunphy, a software engineer who's recently embraced the quiet life for some much-needed respite. I settled in here six months ago after a divorce that left me with a bitter taste and a longing for simplicity. Without family around, I embraced the outdoors. Daily hikes and the wildlife that I'd share my path with offered an interesting contrast to my previous life. As I sipped on some tea, I glanced around my rustic wooden cabin, a comforting haven in these woods. Two knocks abruptly disrupted my solitude. It was Sheriff Grimes from the town. He informed me about a sudden spate of missing persons. He warned me to be cautious and take precautions because it didn't seem like humans were involved this time. What do you mean, not human? I asked skeptically. Trust me, Harold he said solemnly before walking away. After he left, I couldn't help but ponder over what he had said, but quickly shrugged it off as unsubstantiated fear-mongering. As the days went by, more people disappeared without any trace or evidence pointing towards abduction or foul play. 
The town grew tense and fearful as whispers of an unknown threat began to spread through its streets. During a hike deep into the woods one day, I stumbled upon the aftermath of what appeared to be a violent struggle, a bloody mess with no clue as to what had happened. Just as I was about to leave this grotesque scene behind, something caught my attention. Long, deep claw marks cleaved into thick bark nearby. It suddenly dawned on me that Sheriff Grimes was right. This wasn't your typical predator or criminal causing panic in Eagle's Nest. One night, while making my way back to the cabin from visiting friends, I felt as if I were being watched. Though what I saw through the darkness was difficult to discern, there appeared to be a large, hulking creature. As the eerie sound of rustling leaves echoed, my pace picked up. Suddenly it was there, lying in plain sight, the mangled body of a missing man. The brutal scene looked nightmarish, as if something had mauled the man to death and its intent was beyond mere survival or instinct. Determined to face this lurking threat head-on, I set out into the woods with a flashlight and hunting rifle. Fear gripped the town's air, with no one daring to step outside post-sundown, which left me with no choice but to act alone. Unbeknownst to me, little did Sheriff Grimes know that I'd come prepared for anything. As I ventured deeper into the forest, my senses tingled with anticipation, while every creak of a branch played tricks on me. Suddenly, there was an unearthly growl reverberating through the darkness. That's when it appeared, temporarily illuminated by my flashlight, a creature unlike anything I've ever seen, at least seven feet tall with sinewy muscles beneath its rough, mottled skin. Its eyes gleamed red like glowing embers, teeth sharp and adorned its twisted snout. It stood on its hind legs as if observing me, waiting for any mistakes. I raised my rifle, aiming for its massive chest, and fired without hesitation or fear. The impact sent it toppling over and it let out a guttural shriek of pain that was borderline human-like in nature. I scrambled to load another round in case it wasn't down for good, but as quickly as it had appeared before me, the beast vanished into the brush, with only blood splatters assuring me that our encounter had been real. Despite my shaken state from the encounter, I knew I had to try calling for help. With trembling hands, I pulled out my phone and dialed 911. The connection was weak in these woods, but soon enough, a voice picked up on the other end. 911, what's your emergency? the operator asked. There is, I think, some kind of creature? I stammered. I've never seen anything like it before. It's dangerous and still out here somewhere. While I waited for the police to arrive on the scene, I started examining the blood trail it left behind, hoping to get some idea of where it went. The path led me deeper into the woods until something caught my attention. I stumbled across two mutilated bodies further down the trail, the mangled remains of local hunters we'd all assumed had gotten lost some days ago. Their wounds were horrifyingly deep and brutal, barely anything remained of their once human forms. A wave of guilt washed over me as I realized that if someone had acted sooner, perhaps these men could still be alive. Listening closely for any noise that could indicate the whereabouts of this monster, I gripped my rifle tightly, my ears straining to detect if it was nearby. What? What happened here? asked one of the officers who arrived on the scene not long after. He looked pale at the sight before him. I found them like this, I replied quietly. Something attacked this town, killed these men and came after me too. Sheriff Grimes is on his way now. Another officer told me as they began wrapping caution tape around the area and snapping photos for evidence collection. They took our statements and promised that an investigation would be launched immediately. After that horrific night, 
a team of specialists was brought in to hunt down whatever was responsible for the killings in our town. Though they searched high and low, finding only footprints and haunting screams echoing through the woods, they never found any further trace of the deadly creature. Days turned into weeks, each one more tense and on edge than the last. The town mourned for the lost hunters, and many people in town remained terrified to set foot outside after nightfall. Curfews were established, and even then, people still gathered in their homes with locked doors and windows out of fear. Talk of the beast started to trickle down through channels we wouldn't have expected. Biologists from cities far removed from ours started to weigh in, speculating about what undiscovered creature this might be. Although nothing ever came close to a final explanation, one thing was clear. This was no creature any of them had ever seen before. Then slowly, as life started inching its way back to normalcy, some whispers began creeping around town. Whispers that some wanted to hunt down the creature themselves once and for all. Though I harbored the same desire deep down, I knew it would be foolish to venture out there unarmed and unprepared after what I had witnessed firsthand. Over time, the incident faded into memory, or at least the best it could be buried, for most of our small town. But things would never quite feel the same again. The thought of that monstrous creature lurking out there always hung over us like an ever-present shadow. I often find myself thinking about that night, the intensity in its eyes as it stared me down. What did it want? Why did it kill those men? Was it someone's twisted experiment gone wrong? Or something so unimaginably rare and unique that science could not explain its existence? The truth still eludes us, but I know one thing. As long as that creature roams these woods, our town will remain haunted by its presence, by its gruesome legacy, and by our collective fear of what lurks just beyond the shadows. I continue to live my life, watching vigilantly for any sign that the creature may return to our sleepy town and finish what it started. And should it ever happen, I will be ready for it ready to face down the thing that haunts my every waking thought and has forever changed our once peaceful lives. But for now, I can only keep watch and wonder about the fate of the creature that terrorized us all. I always knew there was something off about my childhood home, a cabin tucked away in the dense woods of rural Oregon. My name is Declan Hughes, and until I was ten years old, I lived in that cabin with my parents and younger sister, Ivy. We moved out after my father received a job offer in another state, but ever since then, I've always been drawn to the idea of returning to our old cabin and confronting whatever it was that made me so uneasy. So when the opportunity presented itself for a vacation from the monotony of my office job, I booked a week off and rented a jeep to forge my way back into those woods. My heart raced in anticipation as I pulled up the familiar crumbling driveway. Upon entering the cabin, I noticed how small everything seemed, the worn furniture, low ceilings, and narrow hallways barely resembled the massive fortress of my childhood memories. The silence enveloped me as I surveyed the main room. It felt like it had been waiting for me all these years. As dusk approached on my first night back, I started a fire and sat outside on the porch with my phone. Our nearest neighbor during my childhood had been Bill Jensen who lived several miles down a dirt road. As kids, we would play at his house since he had an incredible treehouse. Out of curiosity, I dialed his number. To my surprise, it still worked. Hey, Declan! Long time no see! Bill's voice boomed on the other end. Yeah, man. I responded jovially while recounting how life had been since moving away so many years ago. Just when I asked about his family and any news from around here, 
Bill hesitated for a moment before whispering back something that sent chills down my spine. We've got a problem out here lately. Bill proceeded to recount every incident of terrible things happening around this area over the last decades. Murders, missing people, you name it. From his description, it seemed like there was some sort of creature wreaking havoc in these woods. He kept emphasizing the fact that when the events occurred, nobody saw anything, they just found the gruesome aftermath. My skepticism led me to believe that the community had been making up these stories to scare one another. The next day, I decided to explore the nearby trails and enjoy the crisp air of the forest. There was something fascinating about all the twisted trees standing tall around me while I hiked through this remote location. I came across an old wooden bridge, now alone and abandoned. As I went to step onto it, I found myself hesitating for some reason. It felt like whatever had plagued my old neighbor's tales was right there with me in the woods. I suddenly recalled one of Bill's chilling stories, something about a group of campers who had disappeared without a trace. Shaking off my thoughts, I pressed on further into the woods when suddenly I stumbled upon human bones partially buried on the woodland floor. Panic gripped me as I realized that these were indeed human remains. As a gust of wind carried dead leaves over into a dense thicket of bushes nearby, I caught a glimpse of movement out of the corner of my eye. A large figure, with mottled fur or hide covering its muscular frame and a pair of piercing red eyes staring right back at me. Frozen by fear, it became impossible for me to call out for help. Any sense of rational thought disappeared as my terrified mind screamed at me, This is it. This must be what Bill was talking about. Without hesitation, I turned on my heels and sprinted back in the direction from which I'd come. My heart pounded in my chest as I couldn't shake the feeling that something enormous was mere steps behind me. As I burst clear of the trees and stumbled back onto the porch— I fumbled for my phone to call Bill. Gasping for air, I recounted my experience to him. Those bones, that figure, what was it? Bill listened intently, and after a pause, offered a suggestion. There's an old farmer down the road, Pete Hawthorne. He might have more information. Trying to catch my breath, I said goodbye and decided to head over the next day. The next day, I made my way to Pete Hawthorne's farm, hoping to find some answers. The sun was shining bright, but it provided no comfort amid the terror that had started to control my life. Upon reaching the farm, I hesitated whether I should call for help or try to figure out what was going on by myself. However, something stopped me from calling for help probably the fear of being dismissed or worse, labeled as crazy. I finally gathered the courage and knocked on Pete's door. A tall, wiry man greeted me, looking tired and a bit disheveled. I introduced myself and explained my encounter in the woods. Pete listened closely as I described the bones and the large figure with red eyes. He didn't seem surprised. Instead, his face turned somber, and he glanced around nervously before inviting me in. Inside, Pete began to tell me about a creature that had been terrifying locals for decades. Its appearance varied slightly in each account. Some described it as a deep black shadow while others claimed it had mottled fur. But its red eyes remained consistent. He then showed me numerous newspaper articles dating back years as evidence of prior attacks. Each reported mysteriously missing persons or gruesome killings all linked to this creature. As we continued discussing the creature, Pete revealed that he too had once seen it when he was younger. He recounted how his friend was brutally attacked by an unknown force while they were fishing near the woods. That incident left him determined to uncover the truth behind this monster. Despite wanting answers so desperately, I couldn't fathom how something like this creature could exist in our world 
undetected and unstoppable. Suddenly we heard frantic pounding on the door. Pete opened it to find Rachel, another local farmer who looked panic-stricken. She explained that her teenage son hadn't returned home last night after being out with friends in the woods. My heart sank at the thought of the creature targeting someone so young. I knew I couldn't stand by and do nothing. Together with Pete and Rachel, we planned to search the woods for any sign of her son. We split into two groups, keeping in constant contact via walkie-talkies. The search was agonizingly painful. Every snap of a twig or crunch of leaves underfoot spiked my anxiety. Hours passed as we combed through the dense foliage. As we climbed a hill, we heard chilling screams from Rachel's walkie-talkie. She had found her son. We raced towards her location, praying that we weren't too late. Upon arrival, my stomach twisted at the gruesome sight. Their group was gathered around the mangled body. It was Rachel's son, attacked viciously, his face barely recognizable. At that moment, we heard rustling behind us. A large figure lunged through the bushes. Its red eyes stared right at us, as if it had been waiting for us to find its latest victim. I couldn't handle it any longer. I bolted back towards safety with adrenaline pumping through my veins. The terrifying realization that this creature might have followed me home still echoing in my mind. When I finally arrived home, I locked every door and window, the thoughts about what had just happened leaving me paralyzed in fear. Days turned into nights as I tried to put the pieces together, unable to shake off the feeling of dread and guilt. Over time, life in town slowly returned to some semblance of normalcy. People chalked up those gruesome events to wild animal attacks or terrible accidents. However, I could never fully accept that explanation, for deep down, I knew that there was a malevolent force dwelling among us. I continued to live my life cautiously, avoiding the woods altogether. Yet I could never forget the people who had fallen victim to that sinister creature, Rachel's teenage son, Pete's friend, and possibly even those missing campers. Now, every time darkness envelopes the town, I can't help but feel a chill run down my spine, knowing that somewhere in the shadows lurks a terrifying being with piercing red eyes waiting for its next victim. I awoke to the sound of footsteps outside my cabin on the outskirts of Maple Grove, a small town tucked away in the dense green mountain forest. My name is Archie Breitner, and after the recent loss of my wife, I decided to escape the chaos of urban life. Moving here offered me solitude and peace, or so I believed. Feeling uneasy as the crunching leaves grew louder, I grabbed my flashlight and ventured outside into the black night. Weaving through tall oak trees, my heart raced as I neared what sounded like muffled screams emerging from a distant thicket. As my flashlight illuminated the scene, I saw a hiker bruised and battered, tied to a tree while still struggling to break free. Introducing himself as Cedric Abrams, his eyes expressed panic as he begged me to release him, fearing for his life. Why did no one hear your cries? I questioned. I tried yelling, he uttered fearfully. But this place is so remote. Please help. Moments after setting him free, we heard rustling. The air grew tense. We noticed an unnerving form emerging from darkness. Unfamiliar with this creature that watched us with piercing yellow eyes, it stood still on four legs resembling a wolf but twisted into something monstrous. My heart skipped a beat as it let out a guttural growl. Noticing Cedric's knife clipped to his belt, we frantically planned our escape while walking towards the cabin. Just then, Esme Sutton stumbled into view carrying a rifle. Her disheveled appearance screamed distress. 
she revealed that her husband Roy was missing when she returned to their campsite nearby. Nervously suspecting this beast was responsible for Roy's disappearance intensified our drive to protect ourselves. Regrouping inside Archie's cabin, fear fueled their conversations as they debated which course of action would give them a fighting chance against the eerie creature roaming outside. Esme's hands shook as she discussed her past as a hunting instructor, feeling her anxiety morph into focus. We need a plan now. We can't wait for it to attack. With newfound determination, they planned an ambush designed to incapacitate the creature. Archie kept watch by the window with Cedric, while Esme prepared her trusty rifle. Hours passed, tension bristling. The darkness outside felt suffocating. Suddenly, a horrifying howl pierced the silence, sending chills down their spines. The dreaded moment had arrived. Remember, guys, let's not push our luck, Archie warned urgently. As they spotted movement in the trees, Esme took aim. I just hope these bullets can stop it, she muttered under her breath. Cedric clutched his knife tightly as sweat trickled down his face. The creature lunged from the cover of the trees, its elongated limbs propelling it forward with terrifying speed. Its matted fur was drenched in blood and clumps of torn flesh, making it seem more monstrous than before. Wide, unblinking eyes glared at us, as if to say our feeble attempts at self-preservation were futile in its malevolent presence. We knew it was kill or be killed, and I prayed we had chosen the right plan. Now! I yelled to the others. In a flash, Esme fired her rifle. A loud bang echoed throughout the cabin as Cedric and I threw our makeshift weapons at the beast, sharpened sticks tipped with metal shards. Our aim was true. Two sticks lodged themselves in its torso as Esme's bullet hit its shoulder. The creature convulsed in pain, screeching ear-piercing howls that made me wince. We thought we had a chance, but it wasn't enough. With an angry snarl, it ripped the sticks from its body and threw them back at us. Cedric managed to dodge his stick, but mine struck me hard in the chest, knocking me to the ground, winded and bruised. I struggled for breath while my friends continued their desperate attack on the creature. As we fought back with every ounce of energy we had left, I fumbled for my phone and managed to dial 911. My voice cracked as I explained to the dispatcher that we needed help immediately. A vicious animal was attacking us at Archie's cabin. I knew they wouldn't arrive soon enough. We were miles into dense forest land populated only by hunting cabins like our own. But it was all I could do. I desperately wanted to act upon my urge to yell out for help from any nearby campers who might be within hearing range, but considered that would surely lead them straight into a death trap. Cedric launched another attack, tackling the beast and pinning it to the floor. Esme saw her opportunity and ran for help from neighboring cabins in search of anyone more prepared to deal with an assailant of this caliber. We didn't have time for reinforcements, but we also couldn't just sit and wait for death. Archie pulled me up, and we quickly searched the cabin for anything that could serve as a weapon against this seemingly unkillable creature. As Cedric grappled with the creature— we found a bear trap in one of Archie's closets. He set the trap, hoping beyond hope that we could use it against our monstrous enemy. With renewed inspiration from our find, I raced to Cedric's side, wielding a fire poker as I slammed it down onto the creature's head. It was momentarily dazed, giving us just enough time for Archie to place the bear trap beneath its flailing body. With precision on his side and strategy at play, Cedric wrested himself free from the creature's grasp just in time for its weight to come crashing down on the bear trap. It snapped shut with a sickening crunch on what passed for the creature's leg, cuts deep between the bones as it howled in pain. 
The creature thrashed violently but failed to escape its trapping, though it still beckoned danger with its unrestrained strength. Archie helped drag an evidently injured Cedric toward the door. Esme returned not long after, her face filled with relief upon seeing us alive. Helmets clad on her head and in one hand with another rifle slung over her shoulder revealed success. A group of experienced hunters occupied a cabin not too far off who were familiar with this creature and had been planning their own assault. As they approached furtively in position of defense and with weapons at the ready, recounting descriptions of what they claimed were other demonic beasts lurking around the area, we hastily packed our limited belongings and left the cabin, forever haunted by its gruesome memories. Before getting into our vehicles and parting ways, we lingered a moment to remember Roy, whose body was recovered some days later along with evidence of other campers who had not made it out alive. We vowed never to forget those terrifying nights, bound together by shared fear and loss. The sun was beginning to set as I dragged my tired body to the doorstep of the cabin in the heart of Vermont's Green Mountain National Forest. My name is Arnold Baskin, and I made this last-minute escape to the woods in an attempt to get away from the painful memories of my recent divorce. The cabin was a modest structure, with aged wooden planks and a small porch surrounding it. I could smell the earthy scent of the forest surrounding me as I settled in. The solemn environment felt like a drastic change from my mundane life and brought me a sense of tranquility. My new temporary neighbors were an odd couple, Judy Womack, a middle-aged woman with gossip tendencies I could sense immediately, and Phil Ezra, an amiable handyman living locally. The duo would often visit me for evening chit-chats that I surprisingly didn't mind much. One particularly isolating day, I found myself compelled to explore deeper into the forest. Taking note of ominous yellow caution tape running across trees, in retrospect, foreshadowing trouble, I grew more curious, wondering about what secrets this place held. With each step inside the dense greenery, the atmosphere felt oddly tense. Unknown to me at that time, my path led inexorably toward horror. Stumbling upon an abandoned campsite from years long gone, I noticed traces of abnormal carnage, partially destroyed camping equipment, and pitch-black scorch marks on tree trunks alike hinted at a gruesome finale for those unwitting visitors. Unsettled yet curious, I vowed to find more information about what had taken place there. Discussing it with Judy later on as Phil worked on his truck outside, she mentioned hushed whispers in town about something menacing lurking in these woods, a creature far from human that locals referred to only as it. I brushed it off as rural talk. Surely this was merely a half-formed tale meant only to frighten. Life proceeded as expected for a few days until one night. I was distracted by a strange rustling noise close to the cabin. Moments later, horrific screams ripped through the air as I saw Phil struggling in a hopeless fight with a grotesque, monstrous being. The creature had indescribable features, a mouth filled with razor-sharp teeth, an amalgamation of scales and hide covering its twisted body and disproportionate limbs that granted it unhealthy speed and strength. Terrified, I darted back into the cabin and bolted the flimsy door before calling the police frantically. Minutes that felt like Ian's passed as Phil's dying screams reached a crescendo only to be silenced abruptly. It was then replaced by an uncanny stillness, momentarily raising hope that it had departed. The local authorities arrived to find both Phil's remains and me in complete shock. After recounting my experience to them in disbelieving fragments, they dismissed my eyewitness account of the antagonist by claiming my distraught state had caused misidentification of a large predator. 
frustrated by their lack of concern or understanding, Judy and I couldn't do anything more than grieve. With every passing day, we struggled between processing Phil's untimely death and what it truly meant to face this otherworldly antagonist we dared not confront. We tried reaching out for help from neighbors deep in the woods, but no one responded. Perhaps they too had become victims or fled in terror. An overwhelming sense of dread settled over our once serene cabin enclave as we clung to hope, false hope, that this nightmare would soon end. Time weighed heavy on our shoulders as loneliness combined with ticking clock anxiety wound us into tightly wound coils that could no longer remain stationary. Our conversations delved deeper into local history searching for answers, from stories of missing persons unresolved over decades to whispers about hikers who ventured into the woods never to return. We finally stumbled upon the diaries of previous victims' family members, a gruesome discovery with fragments of text that rubbed salt in our festering wounds. As I flipped through doggered pages, a chill ran down my spine. The more we uncovered about our unknown adversary, the closer we felt to it. The scratches and jarring sounds outside the cabin seemed to grow more ominous at nightfall, mocking us as we clung to any sense of sanctity. One day, while searching the cabin for supplies, I found an old radio tucked away in a dusty corner. We decided to use it to call for help, but we were only greeted by static and silence. Frustrated, I slammed my fist against the table, knocking over the radio in the process. Suddenly, a deep voice emerged through the crackle of static. Hello? Is anyone there? We exchanged glances before Judy responded cautiously. Yes. We're here. Can you help us? There's something out here with us. The voice replied. Please remain calm. I'm part of a team responsible for dealing with situations like this. Tell me everything that's happened. As Judy recounted our nightmarish encounters with the creature and our suspicions about it being linked to local disappearances, the voice on the radio confirmed our fears. Yes, what you're describing matches the behavior patterns of what we believe is a large carnivorous predator, he explained. Over time... This creature has learned to blend into its surroundings and take advantage of people living in isolated cabins. After providing us with detailed guidance on how to defend ourselves and how to track any potential signs of the creature's presence, he suggested we try to find any evidence they could use in their case against it. However, we knew that taking matters into our own hands was not an option. We were just its prey targets. Our main focus now was merely surviving until help arrived. As days passed, we made progress birdproofing and reinforcing our cabin by boarding up the windows and securing all possible entrances, making our home a fortress that would hopefully keep out the beast. One evening, as we huddled side by side in front of a dying fire, Exhausted from our efforts of making it through another day seemingly unnoticed by the antagonists prowling outside, we heard something large slam against one of the boarded windows. At that instant, a strip of wood splintered with a loud crack, giving way to a gaping hole in our makeshift protective barrier. From what we could see through that hole in the fading light of dusk invading our cabin's interior, we gaped in terror at the sight before us. The creature was enormous, with matted fur covering its muscular body, and it stood on two legs like a human, though its elongated face displayed rows of jagged teeth within its snarling mouth. We had unwittingly invited its wrath by reinforcing our cabin, and it became determined to break through the barricade we had placed between us. It let out a guttural roar that echoed through the forest as it started tearing at the walls of our home with an insatiable hunger to reach its prey inside. At once, Judy and I grabbed whatever belongings we had nearby, our coats and few supplies, and hurriedly escaped through the back entrance into the cold night beyond. 
we stumbled through the forest on pure adrenaline. Behind us, we could hear those splintering cracks continuing as if an entire tree was being crushed under some colossus heel, followed by brief silence until we knew it realized we were gone. Running desperately for our lives with no direction or destination except away from the encroaching terror, we were suddenly startled by distant voices. Among them rang out the familiar tone from someone who had been on that radio days ago. Over here! We've found them! Though exhausted beyond measure and passing out from accumulated anxiety and fatigue took over, we finally felt some semblance of security. The help had finally arrived. These people looking out for others like us were themselves victims of this thing. With their aid, Judy and I left that accursed cabin deep within the woods where a predator, dangerously intelligent and fiendishly ferocious, stood as evidence. Some nightmares walk among us mere humans. And though the creature's identity remained uncertain, it would serve as a horrifying reminder of the potential evil lurking in the dark corners of an isolated world, forever tormenting those left behind by life's twists and turns. I wiped the sweat from my brow as I hauled the last piece of firewood into the cozy cabin. My name's Arnold Finkelstein, and after a stressful few weeks at work, I needed a break. The secluded forest in Oregon seemed like the perfect getaway. As I sat down to catch my breath, I couldn't help but chuckle at the irony of calling this place quiet. My wife, Marjorie, always complained about how city life left us disconnected from nature. Maybe this little trip will remind her of our hometown. I mused out loud. That night we enjoyed a modest meal by the warmth of the fireplace. The minutes turned into hours. Unaware of the passing time, we talked and rekindled our fond memories. It was only when distant howling pierced our ears that we turned our attention to the towering trees outside the window. Must be some wolves out there, Marjorie commented. She was no stranger to wildlife. She had grown up in a small rural town. The following day, we decided to explore the surrounding woods. The damp forest floor crunched under our boots as we walked through clusters of majestic trees reaching towards the sky. As we strolled by a creek, Marjorie noticed something odd twisted amid the ferns, ripped clothing stained red and violently shredded human remains. We stumbled back in shock and disbelief. Wide-eyed yet surprisingly calm, Marjorie spoke first. Arnold, this doesn't seem right. The howling last night doesn't match what we're seeing now. How could wolves do this? Our attempts to rationalize the situation were fruitless. Something just didn't add up. We decided that it was best to return to the cabin and call for help. On our way back, however, all cell reception seemed mysteriously lost. Upon reaching the cabin, I fetched my trusted rifle for an extra sense of security. The strange discoveries in the woods added an unsettling atmosphere to the cabin that wasn't there before. Marjorie's sister, Imelda, had also come along with us on this trip but had gone off for a walk earlier while Marjorie and I were out. She hadn't returned yet. After my fourth failed attempt to dial local authorities, I felt a rising sense of panic. It became perfectly clear that we needed to head back into the town and seek help ourselves. We couldn't wait any longer, especially since Imelda was still missing. We hastily gathered our belongings, locked up the cabin, and began our trek back through the forest. I took the lead, rifle in hand, eyes scanning for any signs of danger. Minutes turned into hours as we steadily trudged through thick brush and brittle twigs. As we pushed forward on our cumbersome journey, an inexplicable feeling of unease consumed me. Each tree trunk seemed to conceal ominous secrets, only it could tell. 
Suddenly, we stumbled upon a fresh set of alluring footprints leading directly away from town, hidden in a clean patch of damp dirt near the creek where we'd discovered those mangled remains earlier. What were they running from? Marjorie whispered fearfully. That's when it emerged from the shadows, a grotesque abomination with razor-sharp talons clenched into monstrous fists and enormous scaly wings bristling behind its hulking frame. Saliva dripped from its viscous fangs as it let out an ear-piercing scream that shook every tree within a mile radius. My heart thumped uncontrollably as I raised my rifle to meet the gaze of this unimaginable beast. As I aimed the rifle at the creature, I tried to steady my breathing. Marjorie and I exchanged a quick glance, silently agreeing that we needed to flee. However, before either of us could make a move, the creature swung one of its enormous wings, knocking me off balance and sending the rifle flying from my hands. Disarmed and filled with fear for our lives, we turned and bolted in the opposite direction. As we sprinted through the forest, I could hear branches snapping and leaves rustling behind us, a horrifying reminder that the creature was hot on our heels. Despite my instinct to call for help, I knew shouting would only reveal our location to the monster pursuing us. We dashed through the trees, desperate to find shelter or any means of escape. I could feel my legs growing weak and knew Marjorie was experiencing the same fatigue. Just when it seemed like we couldn't go on any longer, we stumbled upon an old abandoned barn. Frantic, and with no other option in sight, we hurriedly ducked inside. We cautiously surveyed our surroundings as we attempted to catch our breath. The barn was crumbling from years of neglect. Holes riddled the walls, providing minimal protection from the creature outside. But it was our best chance at survival until we could figure out what to do. A few tense moments passed before we heard its guttural growl nearby. Our fear rapidly escalating, Marjorie urgently whispered, Get down! Maybe it won't see us. We flattened ourselves against the dirt floor as quietly as possible and listened intently as the creature's growls grew louder and more aggressive. Twigs crunched beneath its lumbering footsteps as it circled around the barn's perimeter. With no way to call for help and my previous attempts thwarted by poor reception in these woods— I knew that this barn couldn't shield us for long once the creature got wise to our location. The situation was beyond desperate. We needed a plan. The creek. I whispered urgently to Marjorie as realization struck. If we make it back to the creek, perhaps we can swim downstream and lose the creature. Her eyes, full of terror and determination, met mine and she slowly nodded her head in agreement. As soon as the creature's growls began to fade into the distance, we decided it was now or never. Our window of opportunity to make a break for the creek was quickly closing. We burst out of the barn with every ounce of strength left in us, sprinting as fast as our exhausted bodies would allow toward the creek that flowed nearby. We could hear the unmistakable sound of the creature roaring behind us and felt a renewed surge of adrenaline. As we reached the water's edge, we dove in without hesitation, fueled by sheer desperation and an instinctual drive for survival. The ice-cold water shocked our senses, but its relentlessness propelled us downstream and away from that nightmarish monster. The further we went, the quieter its enraged roars became until they finally disappeared entirely. We continued swimming downstream until exhaustion finally threatened to consume us entirely. Somehow, miraculously, Marjorie and I managed to find our way back to town. When we emerged from the woods, battered and terrified but alive, it felt like a second chance at life granted by fate or sheer determination. My mind raced with questions about what that horrifying creature was or what its motivations were for stalking Imelda and attacking us. Unfortunately, 
Our lack of knowledge on folklore or anything paranormal only left us with unsettling assumptions about its origins, a trail of speculation leading nowhere concrete. In the days after our harrowing escape, authorities conducted an extensive search for Imelda without success. She was officially declared missing, her fate unknown but shrouded in an air of doom brought on by our horrifying encounter. Now, Having survived an unimaginable ordeal with only our lives and the harrowing experience as a permanent reminder, Marjorie and I struggle with the horrifying knowledge that somewhere out in those woods, a monstrous creature still lurks, waiting for its next victim. I woke up to the sound of rustling leaves outside my cabin. My name is Burton Fleck, and I recently moved to a secluded spot in the dense forests of Oregon to escape the chaos of city life. Little did I know that my quiet retreat would soon turn into a living nightmare. Stretching my legs, I decided to explore the area before breakfast. Stepping out of the cabin, I took a moment to breathe in the crisp morning air. There was a peculiar stench, but I brushed it off as part of the unfamiliar surroundings. While walking around, I stumbled upon old tire tracks and decided to follow them, hoping they might lead somewhere interesting. Growing increasingly uneasy with every step, I eventually came across an old gold barrel, out of place among the flora and fauna surrounding it. Curiosity peaked. I continued on and soon discovered an ominous sinkhole, its contents obscured by murky water. Nervously, I tossed a nearby branch into it, expecting some terrible creature to emerge from below. Instead, all that happened was a gut-wrenching churning up of foul black sludge. Just then, I spotted another resident of these woods, Olga Nanerson, walking her dog nearby. Approaching her, we exchanged pleasantries and shared our mutual bewilderment over the sinkhole. Neither of us had seen anything like it before. We decided to report our odd encounter with local authorities together but were met with skepticism. They suggested we avoid the area and reassured us that nothing sinister was going on. Discomfort lingering from our interaction with authorities— Olga and I resolved to search for answers on our own. We kept in touch over video calls, quickly forming an investigative duo while trying to unravel whatever secrets the forest concealed. One day, wandering further from my cabin than usual, I stumbled upon something truly horrific human remains consumed almost entirely by insects and the elements. Panic washed over me as I alerted Olga. As fast as one could among the trees, she met me there with a million questions we couldn't answer. Heart pounding, we agreed to take our findings to the authorities, yet their response bewildered us further. They treated our claims of a possible killer with condescension and disregarded the extensive photographic evidence we had collected. We left in frustration, questioning their intentions. Convinced something was amiss. Olga and I began surveying the area more closely. Our suspicions deepened when we discovered another cabin concealed by dense foliage near that terrible sinkhole. The door hung open, practically begging us to venture inside. What awaited us in the shadows of that old cabin soon turned our world upside down. Hunched over in the darkness was a grotesque creature, a twisted abomination of dark fur, hollow eyes, and razor-sharp claws. It gnashed its teeth with a blood-curdling sound and advanced towards us with an unnatural agility only found in nightmares. The beast attacked without warning or pity, slashing at Olga's leg before she had time to react. Terrified for her life, I grabbed a makeshift weapon off the ground wielding it clumsily but determined to protect her from harm's way. Despite my efforts, Olga urged me to find help. In the depths of her eyes I saw both fear and a selfless desire to save me from a similar grisly fate. 
Desperate, I raced into the woods looking for anyone who could aid us against this otherworldly foe. My frantic search led me to Glenn Truscott, an older resident experienced with hunting, who armed himself upon hearing my distressing story. He didn't question my sanity or dismiss it like others would have. His steady demeanor gave me a glimmer of hope as he joined me on this deadly path back towards my fallen friend. As we neared the hellish scene, what happened next can only be described as chaos, a symphony of bloodshed and terror as the vile creature cornered us with no intention of letting up. Its viciousness was unbound and the guttural roars echoed the torment we felt within. With every ounce of my being, I tried to defend Olda and myself from the relentless assault of the creature. Glenn valiantly faced the fiend, firing off rounds from his hunting rifle in an attempt to deter the monstrosity. The cacophony of snarls and gunshots filled the air, making communication difficult. However, I managed to make out Glenn's urgent command for me to escape. He was far more experienced in these matters than I was, and he wanted me to protect Olga as best as possible. Get her out of here! Glenn bellowed while continuing to fire his weapon. I'll try to get this thing away from you both. I quickly complied, helping a badly injured Olga move through the dense forest. We stumbled over roots and branches, each step bleeding into another at a frantic pace. As we limped away, we could still hear Glenn engaging the nightmarish creature in combat. The sounds became fainter as we drew further from their location, offering us temporary solace. After a time, we could run no more. We found shelter behind some fallen trees and tried to catch our breath. Olga's leg wound was severe. The blood had begun soaking through our makeshift bandages. She was pale from blood loss and her breathing grew labored. I need get back, village. Olga wheezed between gasps for air. Call help. I nodded in agreement. There was no other option at this point. The distance back to our village would take hours on foot even without factoring any potential fatigue or terror. Despite my dread at leaving Olga even for a moment, we both knew there was no other choice. She couldn't go on with her injury, so I left her with a somber promise to return with help immediately. I sprinted through the forest toward the village, my mind a whirlwind of fear and concern for those I left behind. My hope was that they could fend off the creature long enough for me to get help. Upon reaching the village, I desperately relayed the night's horrific events to the town authorities, urging them to assist us immediately. A rescue party was hastily organized, comprised of armed police and several villagers working together in the hope of successfully turning back this unknown terror. With the help of this formidable group, we returned to where I had left Olga. There was no trace of her or Glenn only blood and remnants of their belongings scattered across the ground. As we searched for any sign of my missing friends, the relentless creature emerged from the shadows once more. It taunted us with its hollow eyes, daring us to challenge it again. Engaged in brutal combat with the monstrous creature once more, many in our group suffered grievous injuries echoing Olga's terrible fate. The authorities quickly became overwhelmed as it tore through our ranks with alarming speed and fury. In a moment of desperation, I charged at the beast, tackling it and toppling over a cliffside that had lain unseen due to darkness. Fatefully, my weight shifted just enough to send the fiend hurtling into the abyss below. It shrieked as its body hurtled towards the rocky ground beneath, a sound that haunts me still. The remaining members of our crew helped me back up from the cliff edge and walked back to town in defeat. We never found Glenn or Olga. Their fates remained unknown among countless unanswered questions that plagued us beyond reason. We buried two empty caskets in honor of our fallen friends that terrible day, hoping it would bring us some sense of closure. Weeks later, 
beyond our fragmented memories and lingering despair, rumors began to spread about a cryptid or unknown ancient species, though no one could substantiate these claims with certainty. Rational explanations couldn't dim the ghastliness of the event, and so we tried to move on in silence. I still look back at that traumatic time and wonder if we ever truly escaped the shadow of that night, or if the echoes of fear left us forever entwined with that abomination, eternally haunted by a menace we could never hope to comprehend. It was one of those times when I needed a break from the city life. My name's Reese Kilgore. I used to be a high school teacher before losing my job for reasons I'd rather keep to myself. Escaping to Elk Ridge, Wyoming offered me solace from the mess back home. It didn't take long for me to find a small, cozy cabin nestled in the woods nature at its finest. Upon entering the cabin... It was apparent the previous tenant had left in quite a hurry, furniture strewn about, food still on the table. I couldn't help but chuckle at their disorganization. Maybe they suddenly remembered they had somewhere else to be. While settling in, I met the neighbor from across the forest path, Eldritch Jarvis. I wasn't too too much into small talk but we exchanged pleasantries and he mentioned that we had both recently moved in looking for peace and quiet. Days went by and I found solace in hiking and exploring my surroundings. On one of my hikes, however, I stumbled upon a disastrous scene a rotting corpse. As panic rose within me, reality hit. Calling for help would lead investigators right to the mess I had left behind in the city. Burying that dreadful memory in my mind, I quickly hiked back to my cabin. The next day, while chopping wood outside, Eldritch appeared, visibly shaken and pale. He muttered about something that had attacked his cat last night, a creature with sharp claws and an eerie presence. Great! Now there were creepy beasts lurking around just what I wanted. As days turned into weeks... An air of morbidity loomed over Elk Ridge. Disappearances were becoming frequent. Whispers of brutal killings spread around like wildfire. Each incident was marked with gut-wrenching details and frantic attempts to find who or what was wreaking havoc on this once peaceful retreat. Despite Eldritch's concerns about the town's chaos, I remained skeptical. It wasn't until a new neighbor from a distant cabin, Ambrose Zane, paid us a visit that fear finally took root in me. Ambrose shared his story of how he had crossed paths with an enormous, feral beast with matted hair and blood-stained claws. He managed to take cover in some bushes while the creature sniffed its way around him, only inches away. Though still hesitant to believe in this creature, I couldn't help but notice Eldritch's uneasiness growing stronger. With the tensions in Elk Ridge rising, we decided to form search parties with other neighbors to uncover whatever was behind these gruesome events. Things escalated when we found a mangled corpse further into the woods, fresh this time. The victim was virtually unrecognizable. His face had been shredded gruesomely, and his limbs were dismembered and scattered about. Imagery no one should ever witness— a palpable dread began to surround us as we searched deeper into the forest that evening. Our weapons gripped tightly, adrenaline coursing through our veins. The anticipation of finding this creature lurking within the darkness became overwhelming. As the group of neighbors and I continued our search, we stumbled upon a small clearing. In the dim moonlight, we peered beyond the tree line, straining to see any movement in the distance. One by one, members of our search party vanished deeper into the woods until only Eldritch, Ambrose, and I remained behind. We decided to call for help, hoping we could regroup with the others who were now enveloped by darkness. Our calls echoed through the silent forest, but none of our neighbors responded. 
Frustrated and fearful, Eldritch suggested splitting up. That way, we might have a better chance at finding whoever, or whatever, was responsible for these heinous acts. However, Ambrose disagreed with Eldritch's proposition. He thought separating would put us in greater danger. As our disagreement intensified, we failed to detect something creeping ever closer. It was only when a pungent smell filled our nostrils that Eldritch finally turned around. Before us loomed a massive creature resembling an enormous bear or a feral wolf but far more grotesque. Covered in matted hair slicked with blood and filth, its enormous claws dripped with what appeared to be fresh gore. Its malice seemed almost palpable as it bared its enormous teeth flecked in sinister grime. Eldritch screamed at us to run as the beast lunged towards him. The last thing I saw before turning on my heel was the immense creature swiping its enormous claws through Eldritch's torso as he fell forward with a guttural cry. My blood raced as Ambrose and I sprinted away from our assailant. We bolted down the moonlit path, dodging tree branches and thorny bushes that threatened to slow our rapid sprint. Although no one dared look back, it was clear we couldn't shake off this terror pursuing us relentlessly. The towering monster seemed content to stalk us, knowing it held command over our lives. A newfound horror dominated Elk Ridge, tearing apart our small community piece by piece. Curiosity ignited the creature's unwavering chase while keeping just outside of sight, leaving both neighbors and families on guard around the clock. There were no answers as to what this creature was or why it terrorized us so relentlessly. In our panic, Ambrose and I came to a cliff's edge, overlooking a vast and tumultuous river. As the last vestiges of hope vanished before us like smoke in the wind, the colossal beast closed in for its final attack. Our foe's red eyes burned like fire in the night, bloodlust overtaking its gaze. Ambrose and I knew we were cornered, and there was no way out. Neither one of us had any experience with gruesome anomalies like this. How could we? We were ordinary folk. As the grotesque beast bore down on us, we realized this would be our last stand. I looked at Ambrose with abject terror as all rational thought fled from my terrified mind. Then, piercing through the darkness, came the blur of something flying straight at our monstrous adversary. In those last seconds before impact, I recognized a number of the search party members wielding flaming torches. The light seared into the creature's eyes as they thrust their fiery weapons forward, driving the monster back towards the forest's edge. As fear overtook its expression, I couldn't help but feel sympathy for this unhinged animal that had forsaken its own vibrant existence to haunt ours. The neighbors continued to drive it back until it disappeared into the darkness from which it had emerged. We huddled together near that cliff, only now realizing how many lives had been lost in those harrowing days. Our lives changed that night as we grieved beloved friends like Eldritch. Although Elk Ridge would never be quite what it once was, we had survived. As days melted back into weeks, peace seemed to return, although the killing of the creature remained shrouded in mystery. And while we may never know what that beast was nor why it terrorized us in such a gruesome manner, it's now just a chilling memory of a brutal chapter in Elk Ridge history, one that none who faced it could ever forget. I woke up to the sound of a branch snapping outside my cabin in the Dakota woods. My name's Leland Hartridge, and I'm a freelance writer who decided to seek solace in nature for a change. A getaway from the city, per se. I told you, you shouldn't have bought this place, my friend Vern Masterson remarked from the corner. Isolation is never good for anyone. That's debatable. I replied with a chuckle. It brings peace to work on my writing. 
As we ate breakfast, Lorraine Westcott, my sister, mentioned her concern about the local news. A missing person reported nearby, just last week. Social worker by profession, she had an empathetic heart. A brisk walk was our plan for the day, to familiarize ourselves with the area. We stepped outside and began our exploration. The lush green trees and chirping birds brought a sense of tranquility like none other. The peace was disrupted when we stumbled upon a makeshift grave, bones partially protruding from the loose soil. We all exchanged horrified glances and discussed whether to contact authorities. However, no network connection halted that. Darn it! Vern hit his palm against his forehead. I wonder if this has to do with that missing person Lorraine mentioned. The concern gradually turned into curiosity as we continued walking along the beaten path. Moments later, we heard leaves rustling nearby. Slowly creeping towards the sound, we discovered an oddly shaped creature lurking behind bushes. Trembling in fear but remaining silent as it feasted on what seemed to be raw flesh. Its hollow black eyes and glistening red scales were profoundly disturbing. Guys, retreat carefully! I whispered intensely through clenched teeth. Carefully retracing our steps back to the trail, panic finally set in once far enough away from the creature's sight. It must have killed that man! Lorraine gasped, her voice trembling. It could kill us too if it finds out we saw it! Then added, we hurried back to the safety of the cabin, locked all doors, and covered the windows with thick curtains. Lorraine grabbed a rifle from above the fireplace, along with several rounds of ammunition. We need to keep our guards up. Let's set up shifts, I insisted. Everyone nodded in agreement. The knowledge of a killer creature lurking nearby filled us with terror. Deep down, we knew this creature was capable of inflicting not just pain but death itself. Night fell, and as determined, we took turns keeping watch. Eerie silence penetrated the air, interrupted only by occasional rattles and scratching sounds outside the cabin. During my watch duty, tensions escalated as I spotted a dark figure standing at the edge of the tree ling. My heart raced, but I couldn't look away. Guys! It's here! Lorraine instantly took control of the situation, aiming her rifle at the figure while Vern barked orders to move and stay low. The enormity of this situation weighed heavily on my mind as memories gushed forward, a quiet childhood in a small suburban home followed by my ambitious career pursuits and riding all threatened by this unforeseen horror lurking in these woods. Bang! Lorraine fired a shot that hit true. The creature recoiled but seemed unfazed, looking angrier instead. It charged towards us and slammed into our cabin wall, piercing through wooden beams. Petrified, we quickly developed a plan. Calling for help was impossible since our cabin was an isolated retreat, and none of us had cell phone reception. On top of that, we were far enough from the nearest town to make any means of communication virtually unreachable. The creature glared at us through the broken wall, its massive size and monstrous features apparent, unlike anything we had seen before. It had dark skin that seemed impenetrable as machine gun rounds peppered it throughout the fight, but every time it recovered as if nothing happened. It had a blend of reptilian and mammalian characteristics, with elongated limbs and vicious claws that easily tore through wood and flesh. Vern suggested that someone should get to the car parked outside so we could attempt to flee. Despite fear gripping each one of us, we quickly agreed that it was our only viable option. Lorraine volunteered to distract the beast while Dave grabbed the keys and made a run for it. Lorraine started shouting and waving her arms through a broken window to get the creature's attention. It let out a horrendous snarl, saliva dripping from its sharp teeth that looked capable of tearing anyone apart. 
As it slowly moved towards her, Dave sprinted out of the back of the cabin and rushed toward the car. I heard the car's engine roar to life as I continued reinforcing our makeshift barricade at the entrance. Momentarily relieved, I called out to Dave that we were ready for him to drive us away from this nightmare. However, our hope shattered when we saw the creature pouncing on Dave before he could reach us. In an instant, it tore through Dave's body, blood and gore splattering all over the car and ground. My stomach churned witnessing his gruesome fate. Through horrified sobs and curses, we realized our vehicle escape was now impossible. Lorraine pulled herself together and spoke firmly while clutching her weapon. We must make a stand here. This cabin is the only shelter we've got. It may not be an impenetrable fortress, but at least it offers some protection. As a united front, Lorraine, Verne, and I took position, fully prepared to defend ourselves against the relentless creature. We scoured around for anything that could help us protect ourselves or drive the creature away. Gasoline cans for the generator caught our eye. We devised a plan to light the beast on fire if it came close enough. A heart-stopping growl alerted us to its approach our hands shaking as we held our makeshift weapons. In that moment of truth, the creature lunged towards the cabin, barreling through our barricade with ease. Panic engulfed us as the enormous beast closed in. Courage was our last resort against this relentless attacker. Just as it cornered us, Lorraine doused it with gasoline before setting it alight with her rifle's glowing barrel. The creature shrieked in agony at being burned alive, its wailing echoing through the now quiet night. We watched with a mix of horror and relief as it thrashed about before fleeing back into the woods. Overwhelmed and defeated, we huddled together in our decimated sanctuary as dawn approached. Once daylight broke and we regained some confidence, we started a long trek into town to seek help and report what had happened to Dave and our cabin. Lorraine led us while Vern kept an eye on our surroundings brace for the possibility of another attack from this monstrous being which seemed to defy any known species classifications or scientific explanation. Our lives had changed forever where nothing seemed certain anymore after this traumatic event that took away Dave and left us terrified and scarred for life. As we walked in silence towards civilization, we promised ourselves and each other to remember Dave's sacrifice and hoped that sharing our story would save others from experiencing our terrifying ordeal. My name's Eldridge Bean, and my friends call me Eldie. Life as a park ranger wasn't easy, but it's always rewarding. After my divorce, I rented this isolated cabin in the Appalachian Mountains to unwind and forget. I invited two of my closest friends, Leonora Gaston and Reginald Parks. The cabin nestled in a scenic location next to a slow-moving river. The sound of water and rustling trees had a calming effect. It was simple but cozy, with one large, open living space where we ate our meals and talked for hours. One day, while wandering the woods collecting firewood, I stumbled upon disconcerting rumors shared by some locals. They spoke about an unidentifiable predator roaming these woods that had been tormenting people for decades. The idea seemed preposterous to me but convinced Leonora and Reginald. Multiple incidents piled up, unexplained disappearances and brutal attacks on hikers by some unknown animal were unnerving. But still skeptical, I refused to give credence to their fears. We were enjoying dinner when it happened, a distant scream echoed through the night air. We exchanged frightened glances before sprinting out of the cabin to investigate. We found Marianne Timmons, a woman from another nearby cabin, bleeding profusely from her leg. After helping Marianne back inside our cabin, 
she whispered that a massive creature had attacked her. Its irregular shape was unlike any predatory beast she'd ever seen. Unable to call for help due to poor mobile reception, we did our best to address Marianne's wounds as anxiety increased. I wished we had listened earlier when she mentioned feeling watched while exploring the woods that afternoon. Racing against time, Leonora hurriedly bundled blankets while Reginald lit the old brick fireplace, casting eerie shadows across the room illuminated by weak flickering light as I continued to press on Marianne's wound. Distant rustling from outside heightened our senses. Heavy breaths and frenzied scratching from around the cabin terrorized us. It was no coyote or bear, we realized. Frantically, Reginald and I barred the doors and covered the windows with hastily drawn curtains. Overwhelmed with dread, Leonora began to cry. An uncanny but familiar sense of panic rushed through my body, my hands trembling uncontrollably. We told each other stories of childhood fears to distract ourselves from whatever lurked among the shadows outside. Hours later, it grew increasingly silent outside. My heart urged me to face the unknown creature head-on and put an end to this nightmare. I gathered my courage, brandished a hunting rifle, and stepped out into the open. The moon illuminated a troubling scene of spilled belongings from the surrounding cabin strewn across the ground. Mangled tents, ripped clothing, and abandoned hiking gear littered the area. Whatever had done this had no intention of leaving quietly. With nerves prickling like never before, I tread lightly through the woods around our cabin. No sound but heavy breathing escaped me in uneven bursts while clutching tightly onto my firearm. As I advanced deeper into the trees, anguished cries pierced through the silence, sounds of desperate screams echoing in every direction. Suddenly a bizarre figure emerged, nothing short of monstrous a tall shape covered in luminescent fur that glistened in the moonlight, its face shrouded by long, unkempt strands. A menacing growl emanated as it charged towards me with unnatural speed. I fired a shot at the creature, but it proved to be futile as it continued its relentless charge towards me. Realizing I was no match for this being, I turned and sprinted back toward the cabin, heart pounding in terror. As I reached the cabin, I yelled out to my friends, Get ready to run! We have to leave now! Reginald and Leonora scrambled from within the cabin, their faces pale with fright but eager to follow my orders. We managed to start our vehicle and raced away from the area with such haste that our tires squealed on the gravel road. We didn't speak during the frantic drive each of us too afraid that speaking would somehow summon the beast. When we finally reached a town several hours later, we decided to contact local authorities. While we knew they might not believe our account of what had transpired, we needed to alert them about this potentially dangerous being. The officer received our story with skepticism but agreed to investigate the area and advised us not to return. Over the next few days, news of brutal attacks on campers circulated through town. The gruesome details sent chills down my spine, and it became evident that the creature had left no survivors. A search team was assembled by law enforcement to scour the woods for any trace of this unknown predator. After several failed attempts of capturing or even sighting the creature again, a sense of unease hung over everyone in town. Many people wondered whether they were truly safe or if this mysterious and deadly being would continue its spree of destruction. Unable to find any answers in town, I decided to visit a nearby university's biology department in search of someone who could potentially help us understand what we had encountered. Dr. Stevens, a renowned expert in animal behavior and unusual species discoveries, graciously agreed to hear our story. Considering all aspects of our experience, he proposed that we might have encountered an unknown species or a creature driven to an abnormal state by an unknown reason. 
He could not identify the creature based solely on our descriptions, but he promised to continue researching and asked if we could provide any samples from the area. Driven by a sense of responsibility for the innocent lives lost and needing closure, I knew I had to revisit the location and try to provide Dr. Stevens with any evidence that might help us understand this enigma. Reginald and Leonora refused to accompany me, too traumatized by our previous experiences. I didn't blame them. Upon my return to the site, I found ripped clothing and scratch marks on trees surrounding the cabins. As I collected these remnants, fear enveloped me. The distant sounds of rustling leaves played tricks on my mind, making it impossible for me to shake the feeling of being watched. I quickly gathered a few pieces of fur-like material snagged on branches near our cabin and soil samples from various locations in hopes that they might contain traces of skin or some form of genetic material. My heart raced as I fled the area, hoping never to return again. At the university, Dr. Stevens expressed his gratitude for my efforts and informed me that it would take several weeks to analyze the samples thoroughly. He promised to remain in touch with any developments regarding our case. Weeks turned into months, and despite my growing frustration over the lack of communication from Dr. Stevens, I finally received a phone call as I contemplated sending him a message. His voice held an edge of excitement as he revealed their findings. They had discovered traces of a previously unknown mammal whose characteristics matched our description. Although we finally had some answers, closure eluded me as true justice for those who had lost their lives would never come. The creature remained elusive, lurking somewhere out there like a whispered nightmare. Inexplicably drawn back to that same forest years later after no further incidents were reported, I stood alongside Reginald and Leonora, who had reluctantly agreed to accompany me this time. We remembered those terrifying moments we shared and silently mourned the other campers' lost lives, our hearts heavy with the knowledge that a menacing beast still walked among the shadows. I stepped out onto the porch of my quiet cabin in Blackwell Forest, Pennsylvania feeling a connection to the nature around me. Can't believe I was stuck in that cubicle for so long. I mumbled to myself. My name is Clive Svensson, and after a gruesome divorce, I decided to start anew in this secluded place. Hours went by as I unpacked and settled into my new life. Eventually, the late afternoon sun began its descent. On my way to chop some firewood, I bumped into a wrinkled old man named Asa Tillinghast. Pleasure to meet you. Asa wheezed through heavy breaths. I reside nearby with my spouse, Zelva. While chatting away, Asa gave me a knowing look and shared an eerie tale, something about an ancient and grotesque creature that lurked in these woods, famed for its vicious attacks on unsuspecting folks. My skepticism painted all over my face. I forced a chuckle before heading back to my cabin. The next day at dawn, I went deer hunting with Conal Lavery, another neighbor from around the bend. Retrieving a catch from afar, we stumbled upon pools of crimson staining the leaves. We should call the police! Conal exclaimed, but no luck, his phone had no signal. We felt uneasy and agreed it was best we return home. Jonath Marr but arrived at our corner of the woods later that day. He had left work behind to spend time at his family's cabin. In no time at all, we formed a small band of getaway seekers bonding over backyard barbecues and stargazing in the moonlit sky. As sunset bathed our retreat in orange hues one evening, we began to hear peculiar sounds coming from deep within the woods primal noises that set our hearts racing faster and faster. Jonath volunteered to investigate, 
he grabbed a flashlight and jumped into his trusty four-wheeler. We anxiously waited by our fire pit. After half an hour, Jonathan returned pale as a sheet with a chilling account. He had glimpsed a creature unlike any other, one that didn't belong to this world. He described it as having reddish scales with sharp claws and countless teeth gleaming in the dark. Despite my usual skepticism, a piece of me began toying with the notion of this horrifying beast lurking nearby, Asa's sinister tale echoing in my thoughts. The next morning, Elva bounded up to me, tears streaming down her face. Asa has gone missing, she sobbed. A pang of guilt coiled in my gut as I considered how reality might be entangled with local legends after all. With grave intent and no form of contacting local authorities, we decided to band together and search for Asa. Each equipped with a hunting rifle, we ventured deep into the woods, following trails that threatened to swallow us whole. Hours passed without a single trace of Asa. Tired and hungry, we stumbled upon an old abandoned shack occupied by Lavinia Skulls. Her hollow eyes stared blankly at us when we asked if she had seen Asa. But beware, Lavinia murmured cryptically. My mind was swimming in dread as the sun dipped below the horizon. Just then, among the dense canopy of trees, wild movement caught our collective gaze. Apprehension gripped our throats while sweat rolled down our brows. In that instant... I spotted something massive advancing towards us through the branches, its outline imposing and mysterious against the backdrop of nature's darkness. Everyone back to the cabins! I ordered with urgency surging through me like never before. We ran as if our lives depended on it, because perhaps they did. The surreal image of the monstrous creature nodded our minds our escape hindered by the tangled branches and forgotten fear of the nocturnal woods. Jonath, panicked, fired off a shot in a desperate attempt to deter the rampaging adversary. The deafening boom echoed into the night, but all it did was stoke the furnace of horror that roared with each guttural howl and pounding pursuit from behind. Shadows flitted as we sprinted, adrenaline overpowering the fatigue and reluctance in our muscles. Our breaths grew ragged, the sound of our pounding hearts nearly drowning out the relentless pursuit of the creature that now hunted us. In those fleeting moments when glancing over my shoulder, glimpses of its hulking frame provided a horrifying motivation to keep moving. The enormity of its body was unnerving, rippling with muscles and fur like a colossal wolf. Its elongated limbs propelled it through the underbrush with sinister grace. The distorted snout revealed rows of razor-sharp teeth, eager to tear into flesh. This predator was unlike anything I had ever seen or even heard of something from a hellish nightmare brought to life in the most gut-wrenching sense. We stumbled our way back towards the cabins in the pitch-black darkness of the woods guided by mere memory and terror-induced adrenaline. There was no time to consider why we hadn't called for help. Our only option was survival at any price. The creature seemed to toy with us, taking vicious swipes that cut through branches and sent frightened wildlife scattering in all directions. It closed on us steadily, each step louder and more guttural than the last. In an attempt to aid our escape, Jane hurled a rock towards the monster's face mid-stride. Staggering momentarily, it shook off the impact like a bothersome fly and renewed its pursuit with renewed vigor. I could see the cabins ahead, a beacon of hope amidst encroaching doom. We were so close, if only we could reach them without having our legs torn from their sockets by this heinous monstrosity stalking us from behind. As we neared safety, I witnessed the unthinkable happen. It leaped upon Jonath, who had been just seconds behind us, tearing him apart in an almost casual fashion. No! I screamed, horrified at my friend's brutal demise but unable to stop running in fear for my own life. 
a fact which I would have to grapple with later. The rest of us darted into the cabins and bolted the doors, praying fervently that these flimsy wooden barriers would hold. We sunk into corners, waiting feverishly for the beast to crash through the walls, each second feeling like an eternity. To our amazement, nothing happened. Hours crawled by. A short time after dawn broke through the canopy above, we dared to leave our hiding places. There remained no sign of the nightmare beast nor its victim. No blood, no claw marks nothing but utter silence, and our haunting memories stood testament to last night's events. As we mournfully remembered Jonath, together we struggled to fathom what could have compelled such a horror to prey upon us. Was it hunger? Curiosity? Malice? Further speculation felt like an exercise in futility. Unsurprisingly, none of us were willing to spend another night here. We made haste to leave this cursed place behind and never return. While en route to our vehicles, we chanced upon Lavinia's skulls once more near her shack. She neither confirmed nor denied knowing anything about this monstrous attacker. Even now, racking my brain for potential answers yielded no results satisfying enough or even remotely plausible. It made no sense, but of course not, such is the nature of preposterous nightmares stripped of logic and reason. Perhaps some things are better left unknown and shrouded in mystery and myth alike. What occurred on that fateful expedition in those remote woods shall remain an open wound seared into our souls forevermore, one from which we may never find respite or closure. In uneasy unity coded in shared trauma, we left behind our horrific ordeal that day with only one another for solace haunted victims relinquishing hope of ever understanding what transpired during those gruesome hours as hunted prey yet surviving by some inexplicable grace. And while we cannot wipe this lingering dread from the recesses of our hearts, we may at least cling to the sweet relief of our survival, never to visit that forsaken place again. I stood in front of our rented cabin, breathing in the fresh air of the pine tree forest in Oregon. My name's Ezekiel Thompson, and I needed a change, a break from city life. I decided to bring Hieronymus Smith, a college buddy who shares my passion for fishing and hiking. As we entered, the rustic cabin was exactly what we were hoping for, cozy and quiet. We spent endless hours indulging ourselves in nature, not knowing that it would forever change our lives. One day, Hieronymus found something strange near the river bank, a human bone. Shocked, he showed it to me and we both decided to pretend it was an odd rock and continued with our vacation. Next morning, when we returned to the spot, the rock was gone and in its place lay a crumpled piece of paper with our names on it. Perplexed by the mystery at hand, we discussed whether to return home or continue with our adventure. However, as rational individuals we chose to stay, believing it was probably a prank. Days passed, and we began sensing that someone was watching us. We dismissed it as paranoia due to the bone incident until one evening when I saw something lurking in the woods. It appeared as an indistinct silhouette, but there was something oddly menacing about its hunched form. We cautiously shared stories around the campfire that night about missing persons in Oregon all mysteriously disappearing from rented cabins, an unsettling confirmation of our fears. Hieronymus suggested we arm ourselves with hunting knives and guns that we brought along for sport. The following morning we stumbled upon a horrifically disfigured creature in a dark clearing, fetid odors wafting from its rotting body. It looked like part man, part beast. Its eyes darted towards us as if sizing up its next meal, two frightened men staring back at death's hungry grip. We opened fire, but the bullets had no impact, 
as if only fueling its growing anger. Realizing the creature intended on devouring us, we had no choice but to flee. We dashed back to our cabin, hearts pounding, and barricaded ourselves in, weapons shaking in our hands. Our frantic phone attempts to call for help were met with deafening silence. The beast seemed impossible to kill. Each time we tried to fight back it would already be gone, leaving behind a nauseating trail of destruction. Hieronymus had found a local legend online about a cursed man-bear that appeared in the woods when the trees were about to change color, a likely cause for terrorizing us. Nowhere was safe anymore as the creature continued kidnapping citizens crossing its dark path, occasionally scribbling horrific messages on rocks outside the cabins they slept in one including our names. Too terrified to sleep and trapped inside an isolated death trap the days blurred together with paranoid tension and exhaustion. Hieronymus cracked a joke about our predicament saying at least we didn't have to worry about dying from all-nighters pulling through college anymore. We either die from sleep deprivation or as victims of this freaking monster. As we waited anxiously for rescue or for the creature's return, we continued devising escape plans while trying not to succumb to despair during those long, oppressive days. Upon discovering that someone else had vanished nearby and had been found brutally murdered, Hieronymus put forth a daring plan. We would confront the nightmarish beast head on one final time hoping we could find an answer that would rid us of this wretched ordeal. The sun began to set as we braced ourselves for battle against an ungodly force. Trusting only our instincts, I loaded my shotgun with bullets wrapped in woven silver strands, mirroring lore of supernatural creatures, while Hieronymus sharpened his hunting knife. Like clockwork, the creature silently emerged from the thickening darkness, hunger and malice in its eyes the wild embodiment of a predator whose sole existence is centered on its prey. In desperate unison, we rushed toward the demonic being exuding death personified. I managed to get off several frantic shots while Hieronymus charged forward, his weapon raised and prepared for a grisly strike. The bullets hit the creature with a sickening thud, but it seemed undeterred by the pain. As I fired, Hieronymus lunged at the creature with his knife, aiming for its muscular neck. The creature swiped at him like an oversized cat playing with a toy, its claws tearing through the fabric of Hieronymus' clothes. Seeing my friend injured, I couldn't stand idly by and let this monster take another life. Disregarding any repercussions, I grabbed a nearby flare gun we had brought as a last resort and aimed at the creature as it towered over Hieronymus. Hey! I yelled, hoping to draw its undivided attention towards me. Over here! The creature turned with a sinister snarl and leaped in my direction. Time seemed to slow as I pulled the trigger on the flare gun. In that moment, my thoughts raced back to Hieronymus' plan and our desperate hope to be free of this nightmare. We needed help, and though we called for assistance earlier in the day, there was no sign of reinforcements. The bright flare shot toward the abomination, illuminating its twisted features and providing a clear view of what we were dealing with. It stood at least eight feet tall, its skin layered in coarse fur with pale patches visible under the glow of the flare. Its face was both wolf-like and humanesque. Large glassy eyes atop displaced rows of jagged teeth bared in aggression. The flare collided with the creature's torso just as it prepared to strike me down. The collision snapped it out of its frenzy. A pained growl escaped from its disfigured maw as it stumbled backward from the force of impact. Seizing the opportunity, Hieronymus dragged himself up off the terrain, eyes filled with fury and determination. He pounced again on the beast while it was still disoriented. He seized the opportunity to drive his knife into one of its vulnerable pale patches, causing the monster to howl and collapse, writhing in pain. 
Hieronymus and I both breathed heavily, our adrenaline settling as we assessed our environments. Though the creature was seemingly defeated, we had to leave before it had the chance to recover. We need to go. Now! I shouted over the creature's guttural cries. Hieronymus nodded in agreement, holding his injured side. We quickly made our way back to our hiding place where we had a truck prepared to facilitate a swift escape. As we drove away, we couldn't help but steal glances at each other, impressed with the teamwork and determination that allowed us to face such an unfathomable terror. Not long after our departure, I heard sirens approaching in the distance from where we had called for help earlier. Relief washed over me as I realized that just for once, we might be leaving this nightmare behind. The attack made local headlines as people speculated on what sort of creature it was that could inflict such damage. However, Hieronymus and I remained tight-lipped about the incident, realizing that any attempt to explain would only be met with disbelief or accusations of delusion. In time, wounds healed with thick scars left behind as a constant reminder of our horrific ordeal. Hieronymus and I became inseparable after that fateful night, bonded not only by friendship, but also by the shared experience of facing something we could hardly comprehend. To this day, whenever people asked about the incident or about the nature of the beast we had fought off, I'm always vague with my answers, insisting it was nothing more than a particularly aggressive wild animal in a desperate struggle for survival against human encroachment. The exact details will forever remain between Hieronymus and myself, serving as an unfaltering testament to humanity's ability to overcome and endure even the most harrowing of situations. The loss of those who were killed by the creature weighed heavily on our hearts, but in their memory, we chose to grow and use our experience to educate others about the need to be alert and safeguard themselves. While the terror from that time has mostly faded from our lives, every so often, I find myself wondering if other creatures like it still lurk in the darkness, waiting for their next prey. I had always been a city dweller, but I needed a change. That's when I rented this cabin in the Lake Tahoe woods for a short getaway. My name is Lachlan Bodan, and I work as a construction manager out in Carson City. I thought the solitude would be refreshing, but I never imagined what lurked in these woods. Upon my arrival at the cabin, I was instantly impressed with the rustic setting. The cabin was small but cozy made of weathered pine logs and nestled deep within the conifers. On my leisurely first day here, with no inkling of the events to come, I spent hours exploring the lush surroundings. It all began on my second day in Tahoe when I met Vivica Fitzhugh, a rare name for an enchanting soul. Our encounter happened on one of my exploratory hikes around the lake, and we quickly became friends. Vivica was staying in another cabin nearby and had also taken refuge in the woods to escape her mind-numbing job back in San Francisco as an accountant. That night, we planned to make dinner together at my cabin. Sharing stories over boiling pots of soup and sizzling steaks was like therapy for us both. We laughed at each other's jokes and marveled at surprising similarities in our pasts. While prepping our meal, we heard rustling outside slow, methodical footsteps encircling the cabin. I poked my head out to investigate but saw nothing alarming, only crisp pine needles crushing beneath my own weight. We finished our dinner without incident but were soon startled by a muffled scream from far away too distant for anyone to recognize precisely where it came from. Despite temptation to help whoever needed it, we knew it would be dangerous to venture out blindly into the darkening forest. The next day began with a disturbing discovery red-stained clothes strewn sporadically over a small clearing in the pines. 
Further investigation revealed smeared blood trails on rocks nearby. The thought sent shivers down my back, but I tried to rationalize the scene before me. Perhaps it was just an animal's attack on another woods dweller? Vivica and I made our way to the closest village to ask for assistance. Maybe someone there could help us understand what transpired without raising alarm among its inhabitants. A village elder named Alaric Wigan described legends of a hideous creature reportedly inhabiting these woods that was quadrupedal with elongated limbs, extremities capable of slashing through anything in its path. The tales were dismissed by most villagers as cautionary superstitions meant to keep children away from danger, but Alaric fervently believed these stories held some truth. Despite his convictions, both Vivica and I struggled with the notion that a perceptibly fictitious creature could be responsible for such brutal acts. We thanked Alaric for his story and reluctantly decided not to involve law enforcement at this time. We returned to our cabins with skepticism but resolved to remain vigilant. We locked doors and took extra precautions when venturing outside after sundown. Newfound fear gripped our conversations and replaced the once buoyant atmosphere between us. Days went by without incident. Our tension began dissipating like fog over a rising sun. Perhaps we had grown complacent and unguarded but that would prove to be our undoing. One evening, while clearing away fogged window panes of my cabin to catch sight of Vivica arriving from her day job shadowing park rangers, I caught a glimpse of movement in the clearing among the trees. Its silhouette slunk through shadows toward Vivica's cabin. It was unnaturally tall with extended appendages that glided across ground effortlessly as if imbued with malicious intent. The fleeting sight made my heart pound like a jackhammer, yet I dared not move a muscle. When Vivica finally emerged from her cabin in the twilight, she saw me standing stiffly by my window, gesturing at the sinister silhouette I had spotted. Her heartbeat seemed to catch up with mine as we both realized that this was what the locals feared. The unseen adversary bolted towards Vivica, and she sprinted back to her cabin, slamming the door behind her. We locked ourselves in our respective cabins and spoke urgently through crackling walkie-talkies. We couldn't risk going outside now that a predator lurked among us. Vivica and I stayed tucked away in our cabins, fearful of the creature lurking just outside. We sensed that our safety hung by a thin thread, and we had to act before it sliced through our cabin's walls. We contacted the park rangers that Vivica had previously shadowed during her day job. Our frantic voices conveyed the urgency of the threat we faced, and they came to our aid without delay. Together with the rangers, we convened in my cabin to discuss how to handle the menace that haunted us. The rangers listened intently as we mentioned the tall, lanky figure that slithered through the shadows silently listening and waiting for an opportunity to strike. We noted its extended appendages and unnatural stature, which baffled even the experienced park rangers. One of them mentioned a rare animal species called the mantis man, an isolated case seen in this region known for its tall, thin structure and elongated limbs. It was usually mistaken for an urban legend by locals. The resemblance was uncanny, but none of us could be sure if this was actually what we were dealing with. We decided not to call the local authorities since most likely they would dismiss our fears as baseless, given there were no reports of physical harm nor substantial evidence for such a creature's existence. In an attempt to escape and avoid confrontation with the antagonist, Vivica and I packed our essentials while the park rangers maintained watch outside. Sweat dripped down my forehead as I stole anxious glances towards the darkening horizon. We tried to move swiftly yet stealthily in order not to attract unwanted attention from our hidden enemy. It was only when my gaze fell on a figure far below in the distance that I realized how gravely wrong we were in attempting an escape. 
There it loomed near one of the ranger's patrol vehicles, its elongated limbs stretching far out enough to envelop one of the rangers who had remained near the truck as a lookout. It let out an eerie screech that sent chills down my spine, and in that instant, our entire plan backfired. We brought this horrifying scene upon ourselves with our panic decision. The other rangers, initially stunned by this sudden revelation, finally snapped out of their trance and scrambled to help their colleague. Armed with tranquilizers and firearms, the brave park rangers charged toward the creature, aiming to disable and capture it. Vivica stood frozen in terror, shielding her eyes from the gruesome sight. I forcefully grabbed her arm and pulled her towards my vehicle while maintaining eye contact with the ongoing struggle playing across the clearing. Neither Vivica nor I could stop thinking about the fallen ranger. He had only come here to assist us but fell victim to a merciless attack by our mysterious enemy. His sacrifice would not be forgotten. Disregarding all previous plans for stealth and speed, I cranked up the ignition while bullets ricocheted around us. The blaring engine alerted the creature of our imminent escape. It spun its head towards us just as we sped away from its clutches. It screeched its final blood-curdling howl, rendered helpless as we sought refuge miles away from that cursed woodland area. As we left the nightmare behind us, unsure if it had been captured or killed, we tried to move on with our lives. But we couldn't ignore mourning the brave ranger who lost his life in a desperate attempt to save ours. Neither Vivica nor I could ever shake off that immense burden, a debt owed to someone who paid such a high price for our safety. We honored him in our hearts every day for his bravery and sacrifice, echoing his name in hushed whispers filled with gratitude and respect. The chilling reminder of encountering that sinister creature will always remain etched deep within us, a scar on the pages of our past a symbol of an adversary that shook us to our core, leaving us questioning our very existence. There I was, sitting on the porch of my cabin in the quiet woods of Nantucket, Rhode Island. My name is August Kowalski and I had chosen to spend some time alone in nature after a particularly stressful divorce. As I stared out at the trees, I noticed something strange that disrupted the serene silence of my retreat. A couple of miles down the dirt road from my cabin was a nearby campground. It had always been a popular place for city folks to escape to on weekends, families, hikers, and groups of friends gathering around campfires in the evenings. This time, however, there was no laughter and cheer that typically spilled from the sight into the night air. Instead, an eerie stillness covered the forest like a fog. What's going on? I whispered to myself as I descended the porch steps and decided to investigate. As I walked towards the campsite with furrowed brows, headlights pierced through the darkened woods ahead. A group of forest rangers hurriedly loaded piles of camping equipment into their trucks. In a low voice dripping with concern, one ranger announced to his colleague how several campers had gone missing without a trace. They were searching for them tirelessly but found no leads or signs pointing towards their whereabouts. Upon hearing this, shivers ran up my spine despite my best efforts to stay composed and skeptical about strange occurrences. The light-hearted atmosphere around these woods felt heavy now, like several secrets hiding just behind their layers of greenery. With this unsettling news weighing on me like an anchor, I returned to my cabin and sat by its window with binoculars in hand. I observed as the search party canvassed deeper into the wilderness around us, combing for any evidence or clues that might help find the missing campers. The rangers seemed nervous with tightly pursed lips as they moved along with an uneasy haste. Hours passed by, and impatient frustration gnawed at me. 
I couldn't believe how this gripping situation was unfolding right under my feet in such a supposedly serene environment. As dusk faded into night, my eyelids drooped heavily, weighed down from the hours spent observing the ongoing search. Despite my best efforts to stay awake and alert, sleep eventually won the battle, washing over me like a dark wave. But it was as if someone had flipped a switch in my subconscious as I suddenly woke up with apprehension gripping my chest. I quickly grabbed my flashlight and decided to step outside to confront whatever was keeping me on edge. Sweeping beams of light danced across the trees, those tall spectators observing an invisible performance unfolding. And then I saw it. A trail of bloody footprints appeared on the ground, leading from the direction of the campground towards the thick forest. Panic surged through me before reason could intervene. Was this new development connected to the disappearances? Thrusting any sense of fear aside, careful yet determined steps carried me forward into the dark forest along the grisly path before me. Heart pounding like thunder in my ears, deep ominous growls reverberated through otherwise silent air. A grotesque creature lurked nearby. As I pushed deeper into the woods, lit only by moonlight and flashlight, a low rumble caught my attention, chilling me to the core. Had I entered its territory? The gut-wrenching scent of decay clung to the air like a malignant presence encroaching on me more with every step. Finally, light beams illuminated a gruesome sight. The brutally dismembered remains of campers littered throughout a small clearing. Beady eyes glinted from behind a tree trunk just outside their radius of light. My blood ran cold as movement registered near that tree. The ground shook with each step taken by an enormous beast emerging from its cover, unlike anything I had ever seen before. Bulbous, mangled flesh hung from its body, punctuated by a gaping, slobbering maw lined with razor-sharp fangs. Claws extended from its limbs like deadly hooks, each swiping through the air in hungry anticipation. Precious seconds ticked away as we locked our gazes upon one another, predator and prey assessing the situation before them. Countless fears clashed within me like turbulent storm clouds, offering an array of unwanted scenarios that played out as potential outcomes in horrifying detail. I had to think fast. The grotesque creature lunged toward me, claws extended. Panicked, I threw my flashlight at it and sprinted further into the forest. Branches and leaves whipped against my face, but the pain barely registered as I focused solely on my escape. Catching my breath, I spotted a small cave-like crevice in the rocky hillside. Without a second thought, I squeezed myself into the narrow space, praying the creature could not follow. Outside of my cramped hiding place, the pounding of the beast's footsteps grew frighteningly close before tapering off in the distance. My mind raced through various courses of action, searching for a way to contact help while keeping myself hidden from the beast until rescuers could arrive. My phone sat uselessly in my pocket with no reception, and shouting for help would only attract the vile creature stalking me. My eyes began adjusting to the darkness of the cramped space around me. Clinging to hope, I discovered a set of vines that seemed strong enough to support my weight. If I could access higher ground, it might buy me some time to figure out how to get out of these woods safely. As silently as possible, I crawled out from my temporary refuge and began to climb the vine ladder skyward. Minutes felt like hours as each footfall threatened to alert my bloodthirsty pursuer. Perched above among the trees, I realized how alone and vulnerable I was. Everyone else unlucky enough to cross paths with that infernal entity was gone. No escape for them from its vicious onslaught. I once more considered calling for help. It seemed too risky with such an unknown predator prowling nearby. Instead, Relying on instincts that had served me well thus far, 
I made my way through branches and leaves which offered sporadic concealment, gazing down occasionally at the moonlit forest floor beneath me. Fear gripped anew at each snapping twig or rustling bush as I imagined the beast biding its time to pounce. Determined not to succumb to this grueling gauntlet, I carefully traversed through the treetops until the sun began to rise, providing long-awaited light to guide my perilous climb. My exhaustion and desperation grew with each passing hour. As the forest sedge materialized, it seemed too good to be true a glimmer of hope against all odds. Mere yards stood between me and escape from whatever nightmare I stumbled upon. Gathering my last reserves of strength, my muscles screamed in protest as I pushed forward. Suddenly, pounding footsteps disrupted the brooding silence. The creature charged directly toward me. I sprinted for all I was worth, bracing in anticipation of those deadly claws sinking into my flesh at any moment. Tears streamed down my face as a fierce mixture of adrenaline and fear drove me onward like a feral animal fighting tooth and nail for every inch of survival. Miraculously, I burst from the forest's suffocating embrace and collapsed on a dirt road, somehow free of the woods and the abomination that called them home. Catching my breath, legs trembling uncontrollably from exertion, I considered what could have spawned such an awful beast. Did it venture here from some remote corner of wilderness? Did humanity's encroachment into nature unwittingly unleash it upon us? These questions lingered with no resolution, only haunting memories that would torment me with every sleepless night. In memory of those poor souls who met their grisly fate at the hands of that monstrosity, and for anyone who may cross paths with it in the future, I cannot stress one thing enough, venture carefully when faced with the unknown. Sometimes darkness holds secrets best left undisturbed. I had decided to rent a cabin in the woods of upstate New York for a change of scenery. Living in the city, I needed a break from the noise. My name is Malcolm Sheridan, a high school teacher who needed some peace. As I drove down the winding road to the cabin, I admired the view of old-growth trees shrouding it on either side. After settling in, I went for a walk around the nearby lake. The air felt crisp, and I enjoyed listening to the birds sing. Mary Peterson's story with her son Caden suddenly came to mind. They had gone missing in these woods just two months ago. The locals theorized that they'd simply wandered off and got lost. With darkness encroaching, I returned to my cabin, not giving much thought to the missing mother and son. Instead, I began cooking dinner while humming an old tune from my childhood. In the middle of the night, something woke me from my slumber. A loud thud echoed through the cabin followed by scraping that sent chills down my spine. Still dazed, I peeked out a window to see if anyone or anything had cast the alarming sounds. What I saw stopped me cold. An enormous creature stomped by with long, sinewy limbs that gnawed into menacing claws at its ends. The creature was aggressive and territorial as it marched around leaving deep gouges in its wake. Recalling my tranquilizer gun at home brought no comfort now as I thought about how useless it would be against something so hideous. Frantically looking around for anything that could serve as a makeshift weapon, I settled on a fireplace poker. As the massive beast continued circling near my cabin, its terror-inducing features became clearer. Hairless and covered in thick, leathery skin, it bore an elongated snout full of razor-sharp teeth. Its eyes were black voids of despair, and those limbs could undoubtedly rip apart anything unlucky enough to cross its path. At one point, it stopped and stood still as if it were listening or perhaps smelling the air. Panicked, I gulped down my fear and moved silently toward the back door, 
hoping to leave this nightmare behind. My heart thundered in my chest with each step. Suddenly, the creature leaped straight towards a nearby tree and shredded it with its tormenting claws. I remained frozen in my tracks as fragments of the tree flew everywhere. Despite my fight-or-flight instincts going haywire, I knew calling for help was pointless. Nobody would hear me out here. My resolve snapped when the creature whirled round and charged directly at the cabin. I bolted as fast as my legs could carry me into the night's darkness, abandoning any hope of self-preservation. I stumbled through the forest, branches scratching my skin as if trying to claw me back to that monstrous menace. Gasps of pain escaped my lips throughout my desperate flight for life. As I continued my treacherous escape, I heard chilling whispers slicing through the air that made me question if I was indeed running from just one creature or a horde of them. The whispers seemed to multiply, growing louder and more frantic as I ran. Each heavy breath forced out of my lungs felt like it would be my last. My legs strained, muscles screaming in pain as I dashed through the woods without direction. A sudden crunch echoed to my left, and I glimpsed a flash of movement another predator-like figure different from my pursuer but equally terrifying. Was this a pack of these monstrous beings? Were they collaborating their efforts to hunt me down and rip me to shreds? I could not afford to ponder these questions for long, as more members of the horde began emerging from the shadows at every turn. It became an all-consuming drive to avoid their violent outbursts as they crushed foliage beneath their colossal feet. One creature lunged at me, just inches from my face. Its guttural growl shook me to my core. I narrowly avoided its grasp and continued sprinting, knowing there was no time to waste. To stop would be to lose all hope of survival. Thoughts raced through my mind uncontrollably. How did I end up here? Why did this happen? And most importantly, how do I escape? I tried to push these thoughts aside and focus on staying alive. Every nerve in my body screamed danger when the horde finally cornered me against a massive, ancient tree trunk. The creatures surrounded me, their horrifying faces too much for any human being to bear witness to without trembling in fear. One creature stepped forward menacingly and reached out a twisted limb with fierce claws eager for blood. Its eyes bore into mine without mercy. The moment felt like an eternity as it gingerly touched its filthy fingers along my cheek, perhaps preparing for the final strike. But then it froze in place, staring at me curiously before retreating and giving way to another creature. This new monster shared similar features, leathery skin and soulless black eyes. It seemed to have some level of authority over the others. This leader of the demonic pack approached me slowly and scrutinized my helpless stance. Then, without a sound, it turned away from me and motioned the others to follow suit. The horde disappeared into the darkness as abruptly as they had arrived, leaving only terror in their wake. I struggled to comprehend what had just occurred, and more importantly, why they had chosen to spare me. Relief washed over me as the adrenaline faded, but the confusion remained. I knew I couldn't return to my cabin. It was far too dangerous. Stumbling through the woods, I found a dirt path that led back to the main road. A passing motorist picked me up, and as we drove away from that nightmare in the forest, my mind raced with questions and theories about my predators. However, I dared not correct the driver's assumption that I had experienced an animal attack. Perhaps they'd think I was insane. As we neared civilization, I glanced back at the dark forest where my life had nearly ended. With no known motive for their decision to let me live, I could only make an educated guess. Maybe these abhorrent beings had spared me as a form of mercy, or, perhaps more chillingly, 
they knew that the haunting memories of their grotesque faces would serve as a perpetual reminder of what lurked just beyond our perceptions. I was enjoying a peaceful weekend getaway at my cabin tucked away in the dense woods of the White Mountain National Forest. My name is Cecil Houghton, and I always found solace here, far from the hustle and bustle of city life. The tranquility shattered when I stumbled upon a horrific scene just outside my cabin. Trees marked with claw marks, deep and vicious, as if something unnatural had done it. I couldn't believe my eyes, but there it was. I considered calling for help but hesitated. The nearest ranger station was miles away, and by the time they arrived, whatever made these marks would surely be long gone. Fearful but determined, I pressed on, seeking answers. While exploring the forest further, I met an elderly woman named Eunice Walgrave who filled me in on her story. Her son Gilbert had vanished three weeks ago. He went to Chopwood one afternoon and simply never returned. Distressed but resilient, Eunice joined me in my search for this mysterious creature. The deeper we ventured into the woods, the clearer it became that we were not alone. Torn clothes and scattered personal belongings littered our path evidence of inexplicable conflict from previous generations that met their demise here. I used to play chess with Gil, Eunice said softly as we continued through the dense forest floor. He loved to win, but he could never beat me. A few hours later, Eunice made a chilling discovery, one of Gilbert's boots caught between two logs. Her frantic screams alerted me to rush to her side. Panic set in as we realized it wasn't just Eunice's son who had gone missing, that several unsolved disappearances over generations plagued this region. Each disturbing incident slowly unveils new details about our unyielding foe. More evidence uncovered as we trudge deeper into the eerie forest, a tattered shirt on a branch, sets of footprints suddenly disappearing. The sense of dread mounted with each passing step. Eunice and I knew we faced an unimaginable horror. We heard guttural growls in the distance, and faint, blood-curdling cries echoed through the forest as if someone, or something, was being hunted. Suddenly, we stumbled upon a small clearing where we encountered a grotesque creature unlike anything our wildest dreams could fathom. It was massive, hulking, with skin like rough bark and twisted thorns covering its powerful limbs. It walked on two legs but had an animalistic presence to it. The creature bared its vicious claws, dripping with sap like sludge. Toxic fumes wafted around it, causing us to cough uncontrollably as nausea took hold. As this monstrosity drew closer, I glimpsed Eunice's trembling hands gripping her late husband's handgun she kept in her purse. She had a glint in her eye that dared our foe to approach us. It's time for you to pay for what you've done, Eunice shouted defiantly, pointing the weapon at the creature. Eunice's grip on the handgun tightened, willing herself to face this monstrous being before us. I retreated silently behind a tree watching the showdown unfold. Why take these innocent lives? Eunice demanded. What satisfaction do you gain from destroying families? The creature snarled in response, its thorn-covered body heaving with aggression. Quivering with fear, I tried dialing emergency services on my phone but realized that the ominous forest was blocking our signal. Our only hope for survival now lay in Eunice's determination and raw courage. Leave our lands! Return to whatever hellish place spawned you! Screamed Eunice, pulling the trigger. Three shots rang out in rapid succession amidst the deafening roars of the creature. The first shot struck its shoulder, which used sickly green sap as it staggered backward. The second just grazed its thick skin and served only to anger it further. 
the final bullet hit squarely on its twisted snout, snapping it back with a pained growl. Taking advantage of this temporary advantage, we sprinted through the maze-like forest, hearing crashing footsteps behind us as our pursuer regained its stride and followed. We didn't know if we could defeat this monstrous creature or even if what Eunice did would have any lasting effects. Wherever we went in the dense woodland, there seemed to be no exit, and our panicked flight left us disoriented. The air had turned heavy with the creature's toxic fumes, filling our lungs with every breath we took. We now had to not only escape the maze, but also find fresh air to avoid suffocating from choking fumes. As fate would have it, we emerged to find a group of local hunters setting up camp nearby. A small pocket of humanity amidst this godforsaken wilderness of confusion and mortal danger. They seemed equally stunned by our appearance as they were with our frantic pleas for help. Before they could react, the creature smashed into the clearing, a nightmarish sight that left them no time to prepare for battle or reaction. The hunters had powerful rifles, but their fear-stricken forms struggled to find composure and courage in the face of the living nightmare. The scene became a desperate skirmish for survival as hunter and hunted clashed in a terrible, primal dance. The creature lunged and tore into any human flesh within reach while we scattered and evaded its frenzied attack. More lives were ruthlessly taken by our brutal enemy as each hunter fell prey to the monstrous adversary. Driven mad by injury and suffocating smoke from a fire ignited in the chaos, the creature began to falter in its relentless assault. Using a brief lull in violence as our chance, Eunice led us swiftly away from the carnage, seeking both refuge and an opportunity to regroup. Emerging bruised and battered from the forest darkness into dim moonlight, we stumbled upon life-saving salvation, park rangers racing to respond to the fire we inadvertently started. With little time to explain, we warned them of the creature lurking nearby before they hurried us toward the perceived safety of their camp. As we sought refuge with our new allies, we vowed that these horrors must be stopped. No more could be allowed to suffer at the hands of this grotesque abomination wreaking havoc in this region. Although I feared that might be an impossible task due to unknown nature of our foe and its unstoppable reign of terror. Days later, I returned to pay my respects at makeshift memorials erected for every missing person including Eunice's son. Their names etched into stones haphazardly placed throughout the forest near where each was last seen, a dreadful reminder of generations past who met unspeakable ends. Years have since passed, but that haunting experience will always remain with me, a terrible secret shared by those who survived. Time and bitter circumstance taught us that we may never comprehend the malevolent conspiracies of nature the inscrutable nightmares of this world and the dark forces that they reflect. In the end, our best laid efforts, sacrifices, and lives lost now fade into legend, leaving only faint whispers of a monstrous past that slowly recedes into the shadows, but never quite vanished altogether. I stepped onto the porch of my cabin, overlooking the thick forests of Montana. My name is Orville Hemmings, and I came here to escape my hectic city life. I was a teacher until my beloved wife passed away last year, and I needed some solitude. So, I turned to this cabin in the woods. The first couple of days were uneventful as I settled in. On the third day, my nearest neighbor Cecil Kwiatkowski came by to introduce himself and give me a chilling warning. There's something out there, he muttered, glancing nervously around. Be careful, Orville. What are you talking about? Cecil looked at me sternly. My cousin was mauled near here last month, 
It was unlike anything the forest rangers had seen before. It was hard to believe him then. But on the fifth day, I found a slaughtered deer in my yard. Its head was entirely missing, its entrails spilling everywhere. I decided it was time to speak to another neighbor about what Cecil had told me. Alma Burgriff lived just two miles down the road so she seemed like a safe bet. Alma invited me into her cozy cabin where we sat drinking warm tea but no mention of coffee or shivers. Cecil is right, she confided fearfully. There's a creature out there that's attacked many of us locals in recent weeks, and it's been stalking people kids from town have gone missing. Now alarmed, I returned to my cabin more vigilant than ever. My peaceful escape suddenly felt dangerous. Later that night, as I huddled under the blanket with an old paperback novel in hand, I suddenly heard heavy thumping outside like something large and heavy was walking along the edge of my property. Quietly picking up my shotgun from above the fireplace and loading it with trembling hands, I ventured outside. The night was dark and cold. I couldn't see much, but I could hear the thumping now closer coming from the woods. Then a stench of rot struck my nostrils. It had to be the creature. I called Cecil and Elma for help, but there was no signal. My heart raced as I realized I was isolated. As I moved closer to the tree lean, a blur came hurtling towards me. Sounds of tearing and crashing filled my ears as enormous claws struck just inches from my face. It broke into my vision suddenly an otherworldly beast standing seven feet tall with scaly skin, sharp needle-like teeth, and its eyes, bright, intelligent, and terrifying in their emptiness. I fired at it instinctively and staggered back. My shot hit something solid, causing the creature to scream out in a guttural rage that shook me to my bones. It wheeled around, hissing and snarling as if assessing me, then lunged again with brutal force. The conflict became gruesome close-range shotgun blasts tearing into its unyielding flesh while its claws raked across my skin like razors, drawing crimson rivulets down my arms. I fought for my life, fueled by adrenaline under a moonlit sky while the forsaken creature raged through the darkness relentless in its pursuit of ending me, just as it did other prey before. A sudden gunshot rang through the air from an unknown source. Was it Cecil? Elma? I couldn't be sure, but one thing became evident. Another foe had joined the battle against this monstrous antagonist. Determined not to fall victim to this beast's reign of terror instilled in our quaint forest community, I pressed on through each vicious assault with renewed hope that this nightmare would soon end. But with every swing of its claws and shattering impact against tree trunks as we grappled through the woodland labyrinth, I began to doubt my ability to survive. As I struggled to keep my footing, I could hear the groans and screams of pain from an unknown ally Cecil. Elma? Whoever it was, they seemed to be locked in their own battle against the monstrosity that plagued our once quiet forest. The gritty determination that surged through me only grew stronger with every second spent fighting this horrific enemy. In a frenzy, I scrambled away from the creature's grasp, desperate to gain some distance and precious time to think of a plan. The relentless creature followed, each step emitting a sickening crunch as it crushed everything in its path. A sudden, sharp pain twisted through my left arm as the beast landed another blow. I gasped under the immense agony. Realizing I needed to act fast or die at the hands of this merciless being, I searched my surroundings for something, anything, that might aid me. That's when I noticed a cabin nearby. Not wasting any time, I sprinted towards it while narrowly dodging another flying strike from the creature. Its massive form left an indentation on the very tree trunk I was beside moments before. I charged into the cabin and slammed the door shut behind me without looking back. 
My breath came in ragged gasps as painful lungs and wounds begged for relief. But there was no time for healing. I had to find a way to immobilize this monster or call for help. But how? Phones were non-existent in this remote area, and no one could hear my desperate callings through these dense woods. My panicked eyes darted around the room for answers but found nothing but dusty shelves filled with old books and trinkets. There was nothing here that'd serve any practical use against such a vicious foe. The door suddenly buckled under an immense force from outside, shattering wood splinters across the floor and slicing mercilessly through my arm. Fear dominated me as I saw the blood gushing from my wound. It would not take long before I bled out. The crashing sound of an axe snapping through the door caught my attention as Cecil swung mightily trying to fend off the beast, Alma standing slightly off to his side. They managed to distract it, relieving me from immediate harm but prolonging the inevitable. That monster would not rest until every last one of us would be dead. I needed to do something, fast. The sudden flash of cold steel caught my eye as I spotted a metal trap hanging on the wall amidst cobwebs. With a surge of hope, I grabbed it and fiddled with my trembling fingers to set up the jaws that could potentially secure our future. A few seconds felt like eternities as sweat dripped down my face, adding salt onto the wounds that served constant painful reminders. The creature let out a furious roar as if realizing what I was planning. But I refused to falter now. With a final, controlled movement, I positioned the trap exactly where I wanted. Alma yelled out as they saw what my intentions were. Bring it over here! Cecil and Alma sprinted towards me, leading the beast closer with every heartbeat. My heart pounded violently in my chest like a stampede but I stood my ground. As it charged towards us bellowing with unrelenting vengeance, time appeared to slow down. Blood staining its jagged teeth drew too close for comfort if we didn't act right now. We were dead men walking. With all my remaining strength, I pushed the trap in its path just as Cecil and Alma dodged its murderous claws. The sharp jaws snapped shut around the creature's foot stopping it in its tracks and forcing it into an unearthly howl of pain, or maybe rage. With the creature momentarily subdued by our makeshift entrapment, we took no chances. We escaped that repulsive being as quickly as possible, heading back to the civilization we thought we knew so well. As we walked away, I couldn't help but wonder what kind of otherworldly nightmare we had just encountered. My only solace was the hope of never encountering one again, but deep down, I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling that our reality had changed, forever. A lasting effect of the unknown terror. In whispers that echoed throughout the forest, I began to believe there were other beings still out there waiting for us. I'm Marvin Johnson, a teacher who just needed a weekend getaway. A noisy city isn't always the best place to recharge, so I rented a remote cabin in the woods of Dawson Forest, Georgia, a perfect spot to escape the chaos. The solitude and beauty of nature seemed like the ideal way for me to relax. The cabin felt cozy with wooden floors and logs stacked by the fireplace for some heat to fend off chilly evenings. Tired from my journey, I sat down on the creaky porch swing, taking in the lush greenery in this silent retreat. No cell phone service. I chuckled to myself, finding solace in being unreachable. Just what I needed. Just before nightfall, I decided to explore my surroundings wandering along a narrow path that snaked deeper into the forest. There was a gentle rustling of leaves and twigs snapping underfoot as I went deeper into the woods. Suddenly, 
I heard something unnatural breaking through an otherwise ordinary soundscape desperate cries echoing close by. A man came into view, his clothes tattered and covered in dirt. Please, he yelled, sweat dripping from his face. You have to help me. That thing is relentless. What are you talking about? I asked cautiously. He named himself as Clarence Roche, claiming that he and his brother had been stalked by an unspeakable creature for days, never letting them rest or even think straight. According to him, it had gotten his brother already and was now lying in wait, ready to pounce. Since we were potentially facing imminent danger but unsure of what exactly it was, we decided not to wait around for it to find us again. We needed help. Driven by adrenaline and fear for our lives though isolated from civilization without phone service or possible assistance nearby, we agreed that finding others or a nearby dwelling was our best bet. As we stumbled through the woods, our hearts pounding with each step, we came across a group of hikers, heavily armed and looking like they were on an intense hunt. They introduced themselves as Justine Thompson, Abe Fletcher, and Carl Simmons. We're investigating a series of murders and missing persons cases happening nearby, Justine explained. We have reasons to believe something unnatural is involved. Hearing this sent a chill down my spine. I felt the dread rising as we realized that this wasn't just Clarence's nightmare. It was something much larger. In a moment of surprising calmness and attempting to lighten the mood, I managed to crack a joke. Well, if we make it out alive, let's grab some ice cream with a side of therapy sessions. This brought laughter, albeit uneasy, from everyone. As we shared our experiences, including the terrifying encounter that had led Clarence and now me into their company, sunset turned to night. Flickering beams from our flashlights danced and penetrated the growing darkness around the campfire we had ignited in the interim. Just then movement. It appeared at the edge of the firelight, an enormous creature with glowing yellow eyes that drilled right into your soul. It possessed elongated limbs covered with twisted, rough scales, a silent stalker in the night. Panic etched on our faces as it emerged from the shadows. Suddenly it darted forward. Shouting erupted as everyone grabbed their guns and unloaded them in a desperate attempt to defend ourselves against an enemy that seemed impervious to our weaponry. Our bullets seemed to only anger the creature as it charged towards us with unprecedented speed. Justine, quick on her feet, yelled for us to scatter and find cover. We took her advice and ran behind trees, rocks, anything we could find. The creature's thrashing and screeching filled the air as it searched for us. Its powerful limbs smashed everything in its path. It was clear that this beast had no intention of letting us go easily. Clarence was hiding behind a nearby tree, his firearm firmly grasped in his shaking hands. He looked over at me, whispering, We need help. I'm calling for backup. He didn't wait for affirmation before dialing the number on his phone. As he informed someone on the other end of the line about our dire situation, I noticed Carl attempting to circle around the creature in hopes of finding a weak spot. It was a bold move that Carl's determined eyes told me was worth a try. Abe and Justine were exchanging signals, coordinating their actions in response to the creature's movements. It dawned on them that Abe's flare gun might be able to momentarily blind or distract the monster enough for us to put some distance between ourselves and the monstrosity from hell. With what seemed like all hope lost and adrenaline pumping through our veins, Abe suddenly fired his flare gun into the air. The unexpected burst of light illuminated every corner of the dark woods with an eerie red glow. To our surprise, it worked. The creature recoiled momentarily, releasing a pained wail as its eyes adjusted to the sudden brightness. Seizing our chance, 
we bolted out of our hiding spots, sprinting away from the confused behemoth. We ran as far as our legs could carry us until we finally found temporary sanctuary beneath an overhanging cliff face. With our backs against the cold rock face and breaths coming in heavy gasps, we assessed the situation. Clarence had informed their team of our whereabouts and requested immediate assistance. Abe and Justine contacted their superiors as well, giving them detailed descriptions about the creature that had been pursuing us. From what they shared, their organization had encountered similar threats before and were prepared to take appropriate action. It wasn't long before backup arrived, armed with an arsenal to hopefully subdue the rampaging creature. A specialized team of professionals geared up while we huddled behind a makeshift barricade, watching with mixed emotions as the scene unfolded in front of us. With precision and skill, they battled the persistent nightmare that had relentlessly hunted each one of us for the past few hours. Finally, after an arduous struggle and with numerous injuries sustained by the brave fighters, the creature fell. As it lay motionless on the forest floor, we caught our first clear sight of this monster's true form. With its muscular frame and rough hide covered in frighteningly sharp scales, one could only imagine its origin or intent in attacking us. It was apparent that nature houses some creatures so horrific that even nightmares have yet to conjure their existence. Upon returning from the confrontation and being treated for injuries, we couldn't help but think about the lives lost to such a dangerous predator. Justine looked around at each of us before saying somberly, Let's make sure their sacrifices were not in vain. The weeks passed since our harrowing encounter. I still sometimes wake up in a cold sweat, memories of that terrifying night resurfacing to haunt me. As we now face more monstrous adversaries stalking through the shadows of this world we thought we knew well enough before that fateful day's nightmare came true, every scream heard echoing through a once serene forest will forever remind me of those souls thrown into perilous battles against unimaginable creatures lurking hidden within our deepest fears. Victims like Clarence, who didn't make it but will always be remembered by his bravery and dedication to helping others, even in the face of mortal danger, and the men and women who fought hard to ensure we lived to tell this story. That creature, that horrifying beast from the depths of our darkest nightmares, no longer hunts us, but our fight against the unknown is far from over. The only silver lining to this newly discovered world is that we all know that we were not alone. Together, we have a chance to protect those in need and put an end to these horrors that plague our reality. I woke up before sunrise, feeling groggy and wishing that I could sleep in. My name's Clyde Remington, and for the first time in my life, I decided to take a vacation. Work had been way too stressful lately. I rented this small cabin in Eureka Springs, Arkansas to finally have some peace and quiet. It was a quaint wooden structure nestled amidst dense forest. A few hours later, after having meager breakfast, I went for a walk to explore the surrounding area. A cold wind rustled the leaves overhead, teasing me with thoughts of winter. As I stepped on a carpet of dry leaves, it felt like nature itself was embracing me. It didn't take long for the peace to dissipate when I stumbled upon an old newspaper article stuck to the trunk of an oak tree with what looked like dried blood. The headline mentioned a series of unsolved murders and disappearances in Eureka Springs over several decades. Curiosity peaked. I pored over the gruesome and disturbing details of each crime as described by the local press. Something seemed off about these events, but I couldn't put my finger on it. That night at the cabin was cold and dark, as though some sinister force loomed over me. My skepticism was unwavering as I tried to push those thoughts away. 
The following day I met Susan Avril who lived in another cabin not far from mine. We started chatting about several topics, the weather, tourist attractions and other mundanities until we finally touched upon local legends, especially one creature that some locals insisted had been perpetrating all these heinous acts since anyone could remember. Susan described an eyewitness's account of a beast that resembled a mix between a bear and a man covered in thick matted hair. It stood upright on two legs and had green-yellow eyes that glowed with an unearthly light. She added grimly that many people believed the creature craved human flesh and that its attacks were too gruesome and animalistic to be the work of an ordinary serial killer. Despite that chilling revelation, I found myself chuckling with disbelief as I walked back to my cabin. The idea of a monstrous being wreaking havoc upon innocent lives was just too far-fetched for me. But then, something happened that eventually changed my mind. A few nights later, I found a trail leading from my cabin into the woods, not there before smeared with blood and strewn with torn clothes similar to those worn by locals reported missing. I figured it could be dangerous, but also felt compelled— compelled in a way that sat somewhere between moral duty and morbid curiosity, to track down whatever or whoever was behind it all. This was no longer about getting peace of mind on my vacation. Something evil lived in those woods, and I didn't feel right just sitting idly by. My steady pace through the forest only increased as I followed the trail of destruction left in the perpetrator's wake. Each new finding filled me with more dread, but also tightened my resolve. Finally, as sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky with a fiery orange hue, I arrived at a small glen where I came face to face with what had been haunting Eureka Springs for so long. The creature towered over me with its nightmarish visage, muscular frame covered with matted fur, snarling mouth revealing sharp fangs dripping saliva as green-yellow eyes bore into mine. Instinctively, my legs trembled with fear as the creature inched closer. The thought of calling for help crossed my mind, but deep inside I knew nobody would be able to reach me in time. The forest was too vast and remote, and I was too far away from anyone who could have aided me. My mind raced, trying to come up with an escape plan. I shouted out at the top of my lungs hoping to scare it away or maybe just to garner someone's attention. The creature paid no heed to my shouts and slowly advanced towards me, its towering height overshadowing me. Had anyone else seen it, they'd think it was some grotesque variant of a bear or maybe even a mutated wolf bred for brutal power. As I looked around frantically for some form of an escape route— I noticed a pile of tree branches on the ground that I could possibly use as an impromptu weapon. As desperate as it seemed under the circumstances, using one might just be enough to ward off the creature for long enough to flee. I kept my eyes locked on the advancing monster as I bent down and swiftly grabbed what felt like the sturdiest branch within reach. Gripping it tightly in my hands, I lunged at the creature and swung the branch with all my might at its side. The cracking sound was sickening not just the breaking of wood but also bones within this awful creature. In return, the monster swiftly retaliated by swiping its massive clawed paw at me. The force knocked me back several feet against a nearby tree trunk. Gasping for breath and throbbing in pain from impact— I knew this vile being was even more powerful than I had initially anticipated. With each ragged breath, urgency grew within me, knowing that every second loss gave this creature another chance to get closer and finally finish me off. Scared but determined to survive, I gathered every ounce of energy left in me and sprinted through the forest to escape. The dense foliage slapped at my face as I plunged through it, but I cared little, survival being my only priority. The creature roared furiously from behind me, and I could hear the earth rumble under its weight as it pursued me with predatory malice. 
These were the sounds of a chase that drove fear deep into my heart. I don't even know how long I managed to run for before finally collapsing in exhaustion, but this monster appeared to have lost interest or given up and disappeared into the darkness. Perhaps it was satisfied with the killing spree it had already committed or maybe it saw me as unworthy prey. Fearful of being discovered by this nightmarish being again, and without phone reception to call for help, I knew I had no choice but to wait till morning light. Sleep wasn't an option fueled by adrenaline and fear. As dawn broke, weary and injured from last night's ordeal, I emerged from the protective confines of a thicket, uncertain of what happened to those unfortunate victims left at the creature's mercy. I stumbled back towards civilization torn clothes, bruised face, and several open cuts on my hands but alive. Relief washed over me when I finally reached the outskirts where people had gathered. Some were already searching for those missing locals reported in the past few days. As they attended to my injuries and listened to my account of the encounters with this terrifying creature, they believed every word seeing firsthand my wounds and fearful state. But what remained unspoken for all of us was, where did this creature come from? And would it return to wreak further havoc on our town? Once recovered over those next few weeks, we mourned our lost community members taken by that unknown entity. Promising them silently that we would never forget them brave souls fallen in those dark woods lives cruelly and surprisingly snatched away. And while the creature vanished that night, the memory of what happened lingered on, haunting the entire town as a gruesome reminder of how fragile and short life truly is. I stepped outside the cabin, taking in the peace of my surroundings. My name's Wilson Grantley, and I was eager for a weekend away from the city. The tall trees in the woods of upstate Washington enveloped the small clearing that held my rented refuge. Birds sang overhead, and the sun filtered through the branches, creating dappled patterns on the ground. In need of firewood for later, I grabbed an axe and went to work splitting logs, making an efficient stack next to the cabin door. As the day progressed into evening, I managed to catch up on some reading in my cozy hideaway. The gentle sound of a babbling brook nearby lulled me into relaxation. As night fell and only moonlight illuminated my surroundings, I took notice of a shadow at the edge of the cabin clearing. A figure towered in an unnatural stance. Unable to decipher its features in detail, it seemed like a great mass leaned forward on long, twisted limbs that ended in large claw-like hands that dug into the forest floor. It didn't appear human nor animal, something completely other. Startled by its sudden appearance, I debated calling for help. But without internet or cell signal out here, my only option was waiting until sunrise and driving back to civilization. So I remained silent and motionless while examining this strange creature. In a single fluid movement, it darted swiftly toward a nearby tree trunk before disappearing from sight again. Heart pounding in my chest, thoughts racing through my head as to what it could be, maybe an escaped circus performer with incredible physical skills. Suddenly realizing that I had closed off any escape route for myself by renting this secluded cabin with no neighbors around only added to my fear. Should I risk making noise by barricading myself inside? Amidst these internal debates on how to react logically but still maintain security, dark humor crept in through morbid jokes about my curious predicament. Taking hope in the thought that I might be simply hallucinating from too many crime novels, I could only continue observing. Hoping for an opportunity to better understand what lurked at the edge of my sanctuary, I watched as it appeared to snatch a young couple who unwittingly wandered into the clearing. 
They were desperately trying to navigate back to their nearby campsite in the darkness when they suddenly vanished. My stomach churned as I realized they wouldn't be escaping their grisly fate. The creature re-emerged, revealing grotesque details of its form. Countless small eyes like black pearls set deep into a gnarled and mutated face. It moved with unnatural agility and speed, its claws still embedded in the remnants of its prey, their mangled bodies like ragdolls from clenched jaws. Terrified yet unable to take my eyes off the unfolding horror show before me, I decided that escaping my cabin in an attempt to warn others would bring me directly into contact with this nightmarish behemoth. My unyielding fear and uncertainty forced me into a paralysis of silent voyeurism as the horrifying incidents continued. A local patrol officer ventured into the forest due to reports of local missing hikers. His primary mission a search and rescue before it became another morbid statistic on unsolved disappearances. Heavy steps cracked branches underfoot, undoubtedly catching the creature's attention. It swiftly leaped onto a tree trunk about two meters above ground level like a predator lying in wait for its prey to pass within striking distance. The sound of his approach grew louder and louder until it stopped just east of my cabin. There was a deafening silence followed by the raspy sound of tense breaths. The officer called out hesitantly if anyone was there, seemingly aware that something was not right but remaining bound by duty and logic, either wanting nor able to accept such monstrous possibilities looming out of sight in this dark forest. The words had barely left his mouth when the creature lunged, letting out a guttural screech, a sound I can only describe as pure, unbridled terror. The officer's gunshots rang out fruitlessly against the unstoppable beast as it bore down upon him. The creature, a bizarre amalgamation of familiar and unknown, had an elongated snout filled with serrated teeth. Its body appeared vaguely humanoid, yet movements betrayed unnerving speed and agility. Atop its cloven hooves were legs bending the wrong way and extensions flexing like an unnatural contortionist. The fur covering most of its form seemed tainted by ages of filth and burrs, giving it the appearance of a poorly groomed animal. Suddenly, it gripped one of its victim's limbs with its terrifyingly powerful claws and pulled brutally, detaching it from the tormented patrol officer's body like overly ripe fruit from a tree. Seconds later, another sickening rip devoured flesh before my horrified eyes. My mind raced in desperate search for any semblance of hope. No chance for escape presented itself. If I tried to flee, that monstrous beast would undoubtedly hear me, paralyze me with terror as it barreled toward me, and that would be the end. Then the thought struck me that if anyone else were remotely nearby— they could face a similar grisly fate without warning. As quietly as possible, I retrieved my phone from my pocket. With shaking hands, fingers pounding at the screen until finally reaching the emergency number to report this unthinkable scene. All while praying fervently under my ragged breast this call wouldn't attract the creature. The operator answered briskly, their usual confident demeanor briefly faltering upon hearing my voice choke with horror. They asked for my location while I whispered as tersely as possible about the deaths and monstrous assailant waiting for me outside. Stay calm and remain where you are, they assured me. Emergency services are on their way. Though heart pounding furiously in my chest, I continued clutching the phone as I peered out the window helpless to do anything but watch as more lives fell victim to this supernatural predator. Emergency sirens pierced through the silence, drawing the creature's incessant interest. Its head swiveled toward the approaching vehicles, distracted momentarily from its slaughter. Stepping backward with animalistic caution, it slipped further into the forest's shadowy depths but not before casting a final glance towards my cabin with a sinister gleam in its glowing red eyes. More officers poured into the area, 
along with several emergency medical personnel attempting to treat any remains that could be saved. But it was all too clear that no one had survived this beast's ruthless assault. In the following days, investigators scrambled to make sense of the incidents. I hesitated to elaborate on the creature's inexplicable appearance and abilities, fearing mockery or worse, being held responsible for these brutal deaths. Only vivid descriptions remained of that nightmarish attacker pressuring their search for answers from which I'm convinced will never be found. While forensics and law enforcement worked tirelessly on the case, public hysteria reached fever pitch as theories abounded concerning bloodthirsty, unseen animals lurking among our homes waiting to strike at any moment. Eventually, life began to return to whatever semblance of normal could be managed in light of such horrors. A sense of collective loss weighed heavily over everyone. I found myself shunning my friends and family in fear that they too would befall an ill fate at the hands, or claws, of this creature hiding somewhere in our very midst. Months passed yet that chilling memory refused to fade away completely. Sometimes when I'm alone in my cabin, surrounded by nothing but night's darkness creeping ever closer, I can't shake the feeling as if it's out there somewhere, lying in wait, biding its time until once again it brings terror before vanishing into oblivion as suddenly as it appeared. It always ends the same way, me too terrified to sleep or even think about investigating beyond the cabin's door assaulted relentlessly by the memory of that patrol officer's strangled screams echoing hauntingly through the night air. But even in my quietest, most isolated moments, one singular revelation gnawed at me no matter how I tried to squash it. Those other victims may have never met this unspeakable monster if not for my presence luring it just a few unfortunate steps within striking distance and that thought was the most horrifying realization of all. My name is Jasper Whitlock, and I've always been drawn to the solitude of nature. Deciding to spend some time away from the city, I rented a small cabin nestled in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. The first day, I appreciated the lush greenery surrounding the cabin and the peacefulness it offered. I tried my hand at fishing at a nearby creek but wasn't too successful. By evening, I crafted a simple meal over the fire pit in the backyard. My second day started uneventfully as well. While enjoying breakfast on the porch... My next-door neighbor Hanalore Radcliffe appeared out of seemingly nowhere and struck up a conversation, saying that she noticed my fishing attempt yesterday. No one to hold them, no one to fold them, she joked referring to my failed attempts at catching fish. She insisted on lending me her late husband's rod, one that apparently brought him lots of luck. Thanks, Hanalore. I appreciate it. I said genuinely grateful before asking her about how conflicted she seemed when mentioning her husband. Oh, he used to love coming here. Until one day, he vanished. Hanalore confided with a sad smile. As we conversed more, we discovered that both her husband and several other people had gone missing over the years in these very woods, their disappearances still considered an unresolved mystery. On my third day, not shaken by this unnerving knowledge, I decided to give that lucky fishing rod another go. As dusk fell upon us and the distinct sound of crickets filled the air, out of nowhere emerged this colossal creature appearing like a twisted mix of bear and wolf with bloodshot eyes that almost seemed to glow in the dim light. The alarming sight sent chills down my spine as it lunged towards me. In a panic, I instinctively stumbled backward while attempting to steady myself with the fishing rod despite its improper use as a by-makeshift weapon. Hanalore's voice rang in my head, recounting tales of the unexplained disappearances. 
I came to the horrifying realization that this gruesome creature before me might have some connection with the missing people. I had no time to call for help. I knew that my chances of outrunning this beast were incredibly slim. As it tore viciously into the bark of a tree, I stood as still as possible, trying not to draw its attention further towards me. My breathing became shallow, and my heart was pounding loudly in my chest as I found myself at a loss for what to do next. Unsure if it was the adrenaline fueling me or sheer desperation, I slowly backed away from the terrifying menace. The creature leered at me, showing sharp teeth that seemed expertly crafted for tearing apart flesh and bone. The realization that I needed to get back to the cabin, or meet a ghastly fate, hit me like a ton of bricks. I flew across the forest floor, bounding over tree roots and rocks in a desperate race to avoid becoming another one of this vile creature's victims. Just as I reached what felt like the safety of my cabin's front porch, its heavy breaths at my heels, I slammed the door shut behind me. I quickly barricaded the door with a nearby bookshelf, knowing it would only offer so much protection against such an overpowering adversary. The creature immediately lunged at the cabin door and smashed through it, splintering wood and shattering glass. As the creature forced its way inside, its monstrous form became all too apparent. It was a towering beast, covered in thick fur and with muscular legs that ended in large clawed feet. Its eyes were a chilling shade of yellow and malice emanated from their penetrating gaze. With nowhere left to hide, I frantically searched for any means of escape. Noticing a window on the other side of the cabin, I sprinted towards it, the enraged creature on my tail snarling and lunging at me mercilessly. Moments before it reached me, I managed to pry open the window and clamber out onto the porch's roof. Below me lied a treacherous drop onto jagged rocks, but with no other choice, I dropped fearfully down, trying to land properly in a tucked roll position. As I hit the ground, pain shot through my leg. I'd obviously injured myself in the fall. As I looked back at the cabin, I saw the creature smashing through furniture and walls searching for me. This provided me with enough time to limp off into the endless woods ahead. My injured leg didn't allow me to move quickly, so I hobbled from tree to tree for cover while attempting to put as much distance between myself and the creature as possible. After a while of this nightmarish exchange between pursuit and evasion, an abrupt rustling sound erupted nearby. My heart threatened to leap out of my throat. The creature had found me once again. Ducking behind a large rock pile, I fumbled vainly for my cell phone, only to remember that I had left it back at the cabin in my panicked escape. Desperately trying not to cry out in pain as my leg protested each movement, I hid as best as I could while listening closely for any signs of discovery. The creature circled around my hiding spot slowly but confidently, turning over rocks and logs with frightening ease its frothy breath and the guttural growls, unnervingly close. Though I wished nothing more than to call for help, there was no means to signal anyone or any hope of reaching me before my gruesome end. As the creature came precariously close to revealing my hiding spot, I heard another guttural growl coming from a nearby area. To my disbelief, another creature, not unlike the one hunting me, appeared, confronting my pursuer with nothing short of primal fury. The two monstrous beasts launched themselves at each other, their massive forms colliding with an earth-shattering crash. Their ferocious duel continued unabated amidst a tempest of claws and teeth, each attempting to overpower the other. This provided the distraction I needed, the opportunity for escape. I forced myself up despite my aching leg and limped further away from the scene of carnage, which seemed like hours before their battle was over. 
Eventually, my unfaltering determination helped me stumble upon a small rural road where I managed to flag down a passing truck. The driver took one look at my disheveled state and immediately offered his assistance. Managed to explain what had happened as best as I could without sounding completely insane. The man's face paled at my account, but he agreed to take me to the nearest town regardless. As we left that godforsaken place behind in his truck, I silently prayed that those vicious creatures would never stray beyond the cabin once again. The experience of escaping such a perilous situation left me grateful for my life and stunned at the horrors lurking within the natural world. Though I would spend days recuperating in safety and regaining peace of mind, I would be forever haunted by knowing that such ferocious nightmares continued to exist in reality, far removed from any folk tales or urban legends others may dismiss too swiftly as simple fiction. I'm sitting on the porch of my cabin, deep in the Michigan woods, listening to the sound of birds chirping. This place is a refuge from my busy life in the city. There's just something about the stillness here that calms my spirit. I take a deep breath, inhaling the sweet smell of pine and check my watch. I haven't met up with a friend like this in ages. Turning over to my left, I see Gideon Whitley an old buddy from college with thinning hair and an even thinner mustache, awkwardly trudging up the steps, talking about his divorce. We exchange pleasantries before he lets out a heavy sigh. Thanks for inviting me out here, man. I really needed this. He half smiles. We spend most of the evening catching up by a crackling fire before deciding to call it a night. The stars glisten through gaps in thick foliage above, and there's an eerie calm to the world around us. Somewhere in the middle of that night, sounds of scuffling disturb our sleep. I crawl out of bed and cautiously tiptoe to the window, seeing flashes of movement in the dark woods outside as branches quickly snap nearby. What is it? Gideon whispers from behind me, his breath filled with concern. I'm not sure. Something's out there. As dawn breaks, we discover footprints outside, enormous and clawed imprints that chill me to my core. They're unlike anything either of us has seen before. We decide to investigate further while keeping our voices low but rifles loaded. We don't know what we're dealing with yet. The footprints lead us deeper into the forest where each step produces fresh crunches underfoot. Fallen leaves carpeting the uneven ground. Suddenly we stumble upon a bloody mess. Remnants of someone's campsite torn apart in blistering violence. Where are they? Gideon murmurs nervously as we glance around, rifle barrels trembling. We see them, three people, their faces coated in dried blood. The broken body of a man dangling from the branches of an old oak tree. Legs twisted in unnatural directions. He must have tried to climb up there for safety. I stayed with sorrow, realizing that whoever or whatever did this has a sheer disregard for human life. The other two lie at the foot of the tree, a woman's pale hand reaching out towards her lifeless companion. It looks like they didn't stand a chance. Gideon says mournfully before choking back tears, Disturbed and saddened by our gruesome findings, we make the decision to notify the authorities, even though our reception is limited. We send SOS signals with flashlights and utilize what little phone signal we have to place calls that never seem to connect. Unfortunately, it appears that help won't be coming any time soon. We're on our way back to the cabin when we hear it. A rumbling growl echoing through the forest a sound so guttural it seems otherworldly attacking us at our very cores. My heart races as I attempt to pinpoint its location. I think it's time we go. Gideon mutters anxiously and minutes later we rush into the cabin barricading ourselves inside. 
As night falls again, shadows wrap themselves suffocatingly tight around us with an inescapable grip, while an unwelcome presence looms just beyond our door. Teeth like steak knives ready to savage its prey. The creature outside is relentless. Its claws scratch and scrape against the windowpane as if taunting us. Both Gideon and I are quick learners. Fear transforms into determination to protect ourselves and each other from this beast. We huddle together, rifles in hand, waiting for it to make its move, regretting our failure to seek help earlier. The hours pass with the cabin groaning under the strain of our invaders' relentless attempts to gain entry. The tension rises in tandem with the smell of musk invading our senses, a pungent reminder that we're not alone. With every passing moment, the assault on our temporary sanctuary intensifies. The creature is cunning, and it knows enough to target the weakest points of the cabin. We've exhausted our resources to fortify the doors and windows, but we're fully aware that it won't hold forever. Gideon and I exchange glances, both knowing we can't rely on anyone else coming to our rescue. In a moment of respite from the relentless torment, we divide what little supplies remain between us. Considering our options, we decide it's best to make a break for it while we still have a chance. Our truck is parked outside, tantalizingly close. Yet the distance between the door and our vehicle seems like a ghastly gauntlet under these circumstances. We lean in to whisper, calculating our strategy with painstaking precision. Gideon will go first, making a mad dash for the truck with a rifle in hand. Once he reaches it, he'll honk twice, my signal to follow immediately after. It's not perfect, but it's all we have. With his fingertips trembling, Gideon unlocks the door and bolts out into the darkness. He uses zigzag patterns hoping to evade any potential attacks, or even delays, from our beastly pursuer. My heart pounds as I count every second waiting for him to reach success or suffer tragedy. The honks pierce through the silence like gunfire two rapid bursts announcing his arrival at the truck. The terrible realization washes over me that by waiting this long, my odds have diminished considerably. But there's no time for ruminative contemplation. I must act now. I sprint toward the vehicle, adrenaline pumping through my veins and fueling my escape at full speed. As I near my goal, having somehow eluded its grasp thus far, a bone-chilling howl shatters my resolve like glass. It awaits there just behind me, revealing its monstrous self in full for the first time. As it rears its massive head, several rows of serrated teeth exposed in snarling fury. Its breath wheezes harshly, and the odor of decay floods my nostrils. Atop of its massive frame, jagged antlers tower forebodingly as if poised to impale. Without forewarning, it leaps towards me with primal ferocity. Gideon fires shots from the truck. The beast cringes and stumbles slightly, giving me precious moments to scramble into the vehicle. We floor it and speed away without looking back. We are fortunate our escape from that hellish landscape has been swift, as the truck covers vast expanses of the haunting wilderness without falter. Although we refuse to glance upon its image again, it becomes clear before long that we were not pursued any further after our harrowing flight. Our adversary's lair remains far behind as we're engulfed in darkness. We may have survived this blood-curdling experience, but I know full well that victory belongs only to those who remain unburdened from such haunting memories. On this particular night, I am left with nothing less than sheer awareness of what was born from ancestral nightmares that had been long forgotten. We were never meant to encroach upon their domain nor disturb their ancient slumber, a decision which cost us dearly. Such details are spoken rarely between Gideon and me ever again. Fear holds us hostage as we replay every vivid memory in consequence of our foolish curiosity. 
neither of us realized the slate would be swept so mercilessly clean and leave us entirely alone at the mercy of fate's designs. We continue our lives well away from the forest that has scarred us permanently, trying our best to cope with the lasting terror forced into our minds by the unspeakable creature we encountered. Though nobody will ever truly understand what transpired on those treacherous nights, we are left with a grim reminder of how humankind sits upon a delicate precipice between darkness and light. Our home was once a sanctuary. Now, it is replaced with perpetual restlessness as our doors remain ever barricaded against the shadows that may lurk beyond. One can only pray our tale will serve as a cautionary warning and convey the dire consequences of trespassing on forbidden grounds. I had just moved into an isolated cabin in the Oregon woods, away from the stress of city life. My name is August Vickers, and I felt like my life was finally taking a turn for the better with this fresh start. I spent my day unpacking and arranging furniture, laughing to myself about an old college joke that crossed my mind while moving my favorite armchair. That night, as darkness swept over the sky, I decided to have a bonfire outside the cabin. I invited my new neighbors, Tamson Hitchcock and her husband Archibald, who lived a half mile away, to share campfire stories and make esmores. After some light chuckles and marshmallow roasting, Tamson began telling us a tale about an eerie creature that dwelled in these woods called the Night Stalker. What do you reckon it looks like? Archibald asked with skepticism. No one knows for certain, Tamson whispered ominously. It's said to have long limbs with sharp claws and hides in the shadows. Some say you can't see its face until it's too close. I could feel the hair on my arms rise a little but shrugged off Tamson's story as just another local tale meant to spook newcomers. A week later... Archibald headed into town for supplies while Tamson stayed behind. I was chopping wood in the early morning when I spotted something strange out of the corner of my a broken branch here, a lingering dark shadow there. Sudden pain erupted through my arm. I shook it off as fatigue from swinging the axe when blood dripped onto my hand. It was only then that I realized it wasn't fatigue but gashes on my arm. That was odd since there hadn't been anything that could have caused it during such simple work. Concerned for Tamson's safety given her husband's absence, I hurried over to their home. As I arrived, Tamson looked pale and distraught. She blurted out in a shaking voice that she collected the mail yesterday from their freshly repaired mailbox and found a letter. The envelope was smeared with dirt and the paper inside was torn with several creepy symbols barely legible on it. I don't know who could have sent it, she whispered tears in her eyes. Someone has to know about the Night Stalker. We need to report this to the police. We made our way to the town's police station and explained the events both before and after Tamson got mail, including my mysterious injuries. The officer, Simeon Lombard, listened attentively but skeptically. Not much we can do about a spooky letter, Officer Lombard said dismissively. But as for your cuts, be cautious while working around your property. If anything else happens or comes up, give us a call. Frustrated with the casual dismissal of our concerns, we drove back home but couldn't shake off an unsettling feeling. That evening we gathered at my cabin making our usual banter with forced smiles but deep down worrying. We decided it would be best if Archibald and Tamson stayed at my cabin until we figured things out. The tension in the air started to build over time as we spent several days together without leaving each other's sight. Strange occurrences kept happening, eerie howls in the night, scratch marks appearing overnight on my cabin door glimpses of elongated shadows flitting across corners of our vision. 
Archibald rechecked his collection of firearms he brought from his house for some sense of security, but continued denying that there could be anything supernatural lurking about. One evening as I was turning in for the night, I felt something grabbing my ankle beneath my bed. I stifled a scream as I pulled the covers back and saw a hand, like a cross between an elongated human hand and the paw of some vicious animal, clawing at my leg. I grabbed the lamp on my nightstand, smashing it down on the monstrous hand with all my strength. Its shriek of pain was unlike any noise I'd ever heard before. I leaped out of bed and yelled for Archibald and Tamson, who were sleeping in the room next door. They burst into the room, armed with a pistol and a baseball bat, both visibly tense. When their eyes landed on the grotesque hands still clutching my ankle, they gasped. What on earth is that? Tamson stammered. Help me get it off. I shouted desperately. Archibald grabbed a nearby chair and began to strike the hand with it, while Tamson used her baseball bat to pry the fingers from my leg. It took what felt like an eternity before the creature's grip finally loosened and the hand retreated beneath the bed. Once freed from its grasp, I scrambled away as Archibald cautiously peered under the bed. There was nothing there. Our fear amplified tenfold with this realization. We were dealing with something capable of vanishing into thin air. We spent a sleepless night huddled together in the central room of my cabin with all possible entrances blocked. In the morning, though exhausted, we unanimously decided to call Officer Lombard again, and this time demand a proper investigation. He listened to us with growing skepticism before finally agreeing to visit that afternoon. As we waited for Officer Lombard's arrival, we stayed vigilant and circled around the cabin trying our best not to let our anxiety get the best of us. We did not have any substantial information regarding our assailant, only that it had long arms that resembled a mix of human hands and animal claws and no apparent physical body. When Officer Lombard arrived, he inspected our injuries and reviewed what evidence remained from past encounters, scratch marks, broken glass. He asked questions regarding our surroundings, but nothing seemed unusual about our property save for these terrifying incidents. As night approached, Lombard suggested he'd stay on guard along with Archibald in case the creature returned. Tamson and I would secure ourselves inside one of the rooms. And so, we nervously prepared for the night. What happened next was the most horrific night of our lives. It wasn't long after we barricaded ourselves in the room that we heard gunshots followed by a guttural, inhuman scream. We rushed to the window to see Officer Lombard and Archibald firing at something elusive. The creature attacked with astonishing speed, slashing at them before disappearing into a blur. Despite their efforts, it forced its way into the cabin through a broken window. Archibald caught a glimpse of it, about the size of a fully grown man but covered in dark hair, with elongated limbs ending in those terrible claws. Its disfigured face bore inhuman features that sent shivers down his spine. We had minutes to act as Tamson desperately called an ambulance while we gathered whatever weapons we could find to defend ourselves. Officer Lombard suffered a deep gash across his chest, and Archibald's arm was bleeding profusely due to multiple scratches. In pain but determined to protect us, they continued firing at the creature as it alternated between attacking and retreating, trying to get around them. Finally, as luck would have it, eternal help arrived along with backup officers responding to the situation. The presence of more people sent the creature fleeing into the woods. After securing and providing first aid for Officer Lombard and Archibald, they searched our surroundings for any trace of the quarry but found nothing conclusive. An investigation was launched regarding our ordeal over the next few days. However, due to insufficient evidence and no credible explanation for whatever had attacked us, 
it was eventually closed without resolution. In light of these events, Archibald, Tamsin and I decided it was no longer safe to stay in our current location and resolved to move somewhere far away from the woods that appeared to harbor that nightmarish creature. Years have passed, and that harrowing experience continues to haunt us. We'll never forget the terrifying nights we endured, the pain of our injuries, or Officer Lombard putting his life on the line for our safety. Though eventually, as the years went by, memories of those nights faded into a distant fear. But always lurking in the back of our minds was that lingering question, what was that creature? And is it still out there, waiting? It had been a long day and the heavy wooden door of my rented cabin creaked as I pushed it open. My muscles ached after hours of driving alone to reach my destination, the rarely visited Silent Falls Forest in Northern California. As a writer looking for a change of scenery, I found this isolated cabin to be perfect for sharpening my thoughts. Upon entering the cabin, I dropped my bags on the rustic wooden floor and looked around. The cozy fireplace, the simple furniture, and the slightly withered books all held a charm of their own. In this idyllic setting, personal revelations came flooding in. I'd grown up in foster care, shuffled from one family to another, and now here I was balancing life as a father and creative professional. The first night passed uneventfully. However, by the second evening, an odd sensation grew in me. My neighbors Jane and Kurt Larson waved from next door as they left on foot for parts unknown. Later that night, I was jolted awake by an unsettling howl that echoed through the vast darkness outside. With no form of communication available due to dead cell phone service and no landline connection in the cabin, it wasn't easy seeking help from nearby dwellers. Besides Jane and Kurt disappearing earlier, me venturing out in pitch-black darkness didn't seem like a wise choice anyway. As days went by, those howls grew louder and more frequent. Soon enough, strange claw-like markings appeared on some trees nearby. Neighbors and other townsfolk began sharing missing person reports. Hikers, locals. It seemed like everyone was vanishing without a trace. Out on a stroll with Henry Tursick, longtime resident, and friend we noticed something off in the distance. A trail of blood led into an undisclosed opening within a dense thicket. Mustering courage yet filled with dread, we pushed away the vegetation only to discover mutilated remains of a bloodied animal, its limbs haphazardly scattered. Feeling responsible, I decided to gather a few brave souls from the town who were willing to confront whatever monstrosity haunted these woods. Armed with hunting rifles and axes, we set out under a moonlit sky, only to flinch at snapping twigs and nocturnal whispers which seemed to multiply with each step deeper into the woodlands. On our path, we stumbled upon the missing townsfolk faces pale and twisted in immense horror. They lay lifeless at the edge of a cliff, their dreadful expressions pointing beyond the precipice. Gathering the courage to peek over the edge, I saw claw marks shredding at the stone surface below. Realizing the gravity of our situation, we made haste for reinforcements. However, pursued by shadowy figures lurking between trees and above branches, panic rapidly spread within our group. People were being snatched right before our eyes or dragged screaming into the darkness, leaving only sheer terror in their wake. As our group dwindled, those of us remaining crossed paths with a cave unseen before. Its entrance was littered with carcasses of indiscernible creatures that fueled fear within our hearts. With no other option in sight, we were all but left to explore this crypt of nightmares. Inside this cold subterranean labyrinth, the sickening stench of decay stifled each breath. Mechanically trudging forward, 
we spotted something slithering in shadows its enormous size larger than any earthly being known to man. Adrenaline kicked in as I aimed my shotgun at what seemed like the head only to hear it hiss in response. A guttural growl echoed throughout the cave as menacing teeth dripped with crimson fluid. Wide glassy eyes bore an ominous glare through black matted fur. Standing before us was a towering leviathan that defied imagination, skin glistening with putrid slime, a mass of quivering tendrils where limbs should have been, and a cruel snarl poised for an imminent strike. The creature lunged at us, its tendrils whipping the air with a violent frenzy. Our group took off in different directions anything to escape this terrifying monstrosity. As I ran, my boots slipped and squeaked on the moist cave floor, sweat pouring down my face. Help! I screamed, praying that someone would hear me. But my allies were undoubtedly in full retreat, just like me. The only sound was the continuing howl of the beast from behind, likely stalking its next victim. The passageways grew narrower ahead of me, and I squeezed through the rocky tunnel. My body scraped against jagged edges as fear. An adrenaline propelled me forward. Up ahead, I noticed a faint light emanating from the end of the passage. As I reached it, I was blinded by what seemed like daylight peering in through a small crack in the cave wall. Desperate for escape, I wriggled through the crack, cutting my hands on its rough surface. When I emerged from the crevice... I found myself on a cliffside with a stunning yet precarious view of the dense forest below. As one foot slipped at the very edge of the drop-off, I suddenly heard other voices not far away. Is anyone there? shouted a person near the edge of the woods. Bracing myself against the tree for support and safety, I yelled back that it was me that our group had been attacked by something horrifying in the cave. The people who had called out were locals who'd heard our terrified yelling echo through the trees and had come to investigate. They quickly helped me up and brought me back to their secluded village at the forest center. Once we reached safety and my trembling subsided somewhat, we told them everything we'd experienced— how our group had been running from something malicious in the woods before discovering a hidden entrance to that terrible underground lair. One older gentleman scooted to the front of the room. I've heard of such a creature, he said gravely, a sorrowful expression crossing his lined visage. My father told me stories of numerous attacks in the past many years ago. The creature's lair sits on cursed land making those who enter easy prey. The words were like heavy blows to my heart as I reflected on my missing allies, the people with whom I had ventured and fought, potentially taken down by this horrendous beast. The villagers arranged for a search party to go back to the cave and look for any survivors or remains of the creature's aggression. They warned me not to go, that it was too dangerous— but how could I leave my friends behind without attempting some sort of rescue? With a heavy heart, I turned away from the group and sat down near one of the village bonfires concerned about what had happened to them and how we would move forward from such devastating events. Hours later, the search party returned with pieces of clothing belonging to our team, torn and blood-stained. Their faces were somber, their eyes filled with grief. They had found no survivors nor any traces of this vile creature. I couldn't help but feel somewhat grateful that it hadn't been me being ripped apart in that cold, wet cave or left to become one more lifeless pile of bones and viscera on its gruesome floor. Gathered around the bonfire with villagers surrounding us in solidarity, we held a small memorial service for our fallen friends. Each person remembered their companion's dedication and bravery as tears threatened to fall. Life eventually began again for what remained of our group. We decided never to forget those who lost their lives and took measures preventing others from succumbing similarly. In memory of our friends' sacrifices, 
we took it upon ourselves to create new paths within this forest. Pathways that wound far from the cursed ground and its monstrous inhabitant. And though I never saw the creature again, nor managed to disprove or confirm its story, our mission to protect others would be an immortal reminder of how precious life can be and how easily it could slip away. Leaving the cave and its terrible history behind us, we set upon this new course together, resolved to build a safer world, one that would not have to suffer as we suffered under the blood-stained tendrils of a nightmare leviathan lurking beneath the earth.